to the draft minutes and the draft minutes of the committee for the 30th of September. And they're outlined on your uh, pack at page 273. And I have the members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. And then, if that's so, is that agreed? Agreed. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay. Any matters arising from the minutes? No. No matters arising. Thank you, members. And at this stage, I'll hand over to the chair who has just walked uh, into the room. Thank you, Your Honour. <laughs> Sorry, members, just bear with us. Okay, okay, members, thanks very much indeed, Robin. I appreciate uh, the assistance this morning. Uh, agenda item seven then is correspondence. Members, uh, can I refer members to page 279 where we have 15 items of correspondence? A summary note is included at page 280 to 282. Can I ask the clerk to speak to the correspondence? Thanks, Chairperson. Um, again, everybody's in the spotlight, so that's good. Um, so can I ask, Chairperson, if uh, members are content to dispose of the correspondence as per the summary note at page 280 with um, the following exceptions? Um, the first being is item 7.2, which is at 283. This is a response from SIA on the examination appeals process. Um, so the committee received some correspondence, which is marked as restricted because it gives some personal details of uh, a student for, uh, by their parents. But the correspondence, they indicated quite a lot of concerns about the examination appeals process. And SIA has actually come back with actually quite a lot of answers. So um, I can ask Chairperson of the committee is content to note for now and then to forward this correspondence to the parents who uh, raised that issue. Great. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Then the other one, I just wanted the other couple of ones I wanted to point out was item uh, 7.7. .7. This is at page 344. This is correspondence from Steve Aitken, MLA, about EU exit arrangements. Uh, it's understood that this correspondence was sent in error and was not endorsed by the Committee for Finance. You'll note it's signed as chairperson of the committee. Um, so uh, can I ask chairperson if the committee are content to note? Content to note, members. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Then at page uh, 346, item 7.8, this is correspondence from um, the sorry, uh, Education Authority Chairperson confirming attendance at the committee on the 14th of October to discuss issues relating to governance and SEN. I understand that the chairperson will be accompanied by Dr Andy McMoran. Um, the committee wrote to the uh, clerk of the assembly, the chief executive, about the availability of a suitable committee room, committee room for this briefing. The assumption being, well, my assumption actually being that members would want to attend in person. However, following recent public health developments, both in um, FOIL and I'm, I'm guessing in Uri and Orma, I don't expect members will be attending in person. Um, I also understand that the witnesses would like to use Starleaf as well. So, Chair, can I ask members if that is the case and if the committee is therefore content to meet here next week in room 29 with some members and whoops, all witnesses um, being on Starleaf uh, for this closed session? Members content? Content, agreed. Very good. Thanks, Thanks, sir. And then moving on, and there are quite a bit of other bits of correspondence here, but at um, item 7.15, which is at page 443, this is correspondence from the Minister about the Coronavirus Act 2020 temporary modification of education duties, number 13. So we get these notices every now and then. The committee's role is really just to note them. We can't change them. Um, but the notice appears to relate to children that have not tested positive for COVID, but have had to isolate owing to an outbreak at a school and enables voluntary grammar and uh, grant maintained integrated schools to provide a free school meal alternative. Um, so this is not a payment extension notice. This is not, you're not going to pay the parents free school need money. It's some kind of alternative. Um, I'm not clear how um, schools are to provide those alternatives and it seems to be an enabling rather than a compelling power. So can I ask the chair if the committee is content to write the DE and just seek clarity on the position for children on free school meals who cannot attend school owing to um, COVID? Members agreed, yeah. Agreed. 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 Stuff. So, um, that was all I had, Chairperson. If members are content with the correspondence, is there anything else which jumps out the page at them? No, it's uh, time to indicate. 
members wish to raise any matters in relation to correspondence? No. Okay. It's us for correspondence then, Clark. Yep. Agenda item 8 is forward work programme. Can I refer members to meeting packs which include at page 452 a revised draft forward work programme and ask the clerk to speak to this item? Uh, so, Chairperson, hold on. This has gone a bit faster than expected and my tablet has given up. So, um, just what I wanted to ask members about was um, following the meeting last week, we'd moved the informal meetings to 9.30 on a Tuesday. So the first of those would be Tuesday 13th of October at 9.30 with the Equality Coalition and Equality Commission. So can I ask, Chairperson, if members are indeed available to dial into that, probably on Microsoft Teams? Uh, I'm just conscious that members have a lot of other demands on their time. Um, and uh, does that time scale actually work for them? Members, content? Uh, there's... Chair. Karen? Um, I would be okay for um, this Tuesday, but I am not sure about every other Tuesday. And I suppose it's it's really at this stage as well. Um, we know in terms of the level of business can change, you know, just when we arrive. So it might prove an issue, but at the minute I, I would be okay, but I can't say it for working for every. Okay. Okay. Uh, Robbie, yeah. I think if it's, it, 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 occasionally it would work for me, but mostly it won't. Uh, I've prepped to do as, as work and so on um, on Tuesday morning. So um, I would find myself having to then sort of look at the, the, the material of it and ma making a decision. So um, occasionally I could do that, but uh, as a rule, it would be difficult enough. Okay. Any other members? Okay. The rationale for Tuesday at 9.30 is... Sorry, Justin, do you want to come in there? No. Well, what's, what's the scheduling? Just to repeat, please, what the scheduling is. Yeah, so the, the rationale is that obviously it's extremely challenging to get through every request to meet with the Education Committee in formal um, meeting. Therefore, prior to the pandemic, we obviously would have met from time to time, not, not regularly, um, but informally with some groupings. Um, and we had uh, done, tried to schedule that for Tuesday at lunchtime because it's um, a time when people are at the assembly but may have some free time. But it was becoming pretty clear that because that was a free slot, that multiple other uh, meetings were happening at that time. So we're proposing that Tuesday at 9.30 as a time when people may be at apartment buildings but assembly business is not in session until 10.30. might be a slot where we could schedule some meetings, certainly not on a regular basis, but... Yeah, that's good, yeah, that's good, specifically, then, the clerk would appreciate um, members responding to their availability for next Tuesday the 13th at 9.30am with the Equality Coalition and Equality Commission on the equality impact of COVID on children and young people. Um, and then Tuesday the 20th with Angel Eyes on similar issues, I yes, presume, yeah, Clark. Yeah. It is. Uh, and Tuesday the 3rd of November um, for an informal meeting with special schools principals. But hopefully you can see as well, members, from the nature of those meetings that they are um, extremely pertinent, you know, and um, that it is important that we do try to engage with people beyond the formal meetings as well. So um, if members have other uh, days and times that they think would work better, then please forward them to us. But we, I, I think it's worth trying Tuesday at 9.30. And obviously, we can make use of um, Starleaf, if necessary, for anyone if that's helpful as well. Any other? No, I members? think, sir, yep. for all the reasons that you have outlined, I think it's uh, at least worth a try at this stage. Okay. Um, and. I, I can't see any alternative uh, to, 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 to the approach. Um, they are informal meetings, uh, and for that reason, I would, I would think it is probably worth trying to, to, to meet with. Yep. Any other Can members? I just ask you, in, in, in it being an informal meeting, uh, does the clerk keep a note of the meetings? What will happen is, yeah, a, a brief note, and then the uh, chairperson under chairperson's business will, or yeah, will then talk about it um, at the, the next meeting. So for members who aren't there, Can't and if there are any papers, um, we'll, we'll keep those for members. Okay. Thank you, Chair. 
But okay. chair, chair, we need to be flexible. So some weeks we may need to, to revise that timing just to suit the stakeholder and the, the, the committee. Um, so just build in a degree of flexibility. Yeah, yeah, just ha happy to be flexible. The, the thinking behind it is obviously that um, in, in scheduling diaries, people may want to try and so far as possible is keep, to keep that slot free and, and to, to know, have some degree of, you know, uh, advanced notice that, that that's when we may try to do those types of meetings. But as I say, happy to be flexible, um, coordinating nine MLA diaries if you don't have uh, an agreed, an advanced agreed uh, day and time slot, it's obviously fairly challenging, but um, we'll go with that. Thank you, members. Okay, uh, any other forward work program issues, members? No. Okay, any other items in forward work program, Clark? No, no just that, that okay. the uh, committee staff will therefore be in contact with you about your availability. And if members think if the answer is no, um, do, do just tell us and uh, you know as long as we get a couple of members coming along to these informal meetings that's usually not so bad yeah so, okay yeah uh, prompt responses members appreciate it thank you do you want to go back to apologies and then chairs biz chair yeah certainly and then, and then we have the minister at 10 30 so. okay we'll go back then to apologies members members aware of any apologies no there's none no nope. okay here. chairperson's business then at agenda item four um 4.1 is uh, the review of suspension and expulsion arrangements. Can I advise members that the audit office report on SEN makes reference to an ongoing review of suspension and expulsion arrangements by the department? Members will recall that Nikki had suggested that children with SEN were more likely to be expelled or to be subject to informal exclusion. Can I seek members' agreement to write to the Department of Education and seek details of the terms of reference and the timeline for the review of suspension and expulsion arrangements. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. <laughs> Item 4.2 is the review of the common funding scheme. Can I advise members that in assembly written questions, the minister has made reference to the review of the common funding scheme. This is the scheme under which school receive vital finance. The committee had been due to receive a briefing on common funding scheme review before lockdown. Can I seek members' agreement to write to the Department of Education and seek details of the terms of reference and the timeline for the review of the common funding scheme? Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. 4.3 then is the EA1 programme. Can I advise members in assembly written questions the Minister has made reference to the EA1 programme? This is seemingly a major capital expenditure project which will bring together the salary payment processes for schools in Northern Ireland. Can I seek members' agreement to write to the Education Authority and seek details of the one programme? Agreed? Good. Thank you. Okay. Have we discharged draft minutes and matters arising, Chair? We have. Yeah, um, okay. Could I, could I maybe just um, check then? Again, thank uh, Robin for um, deputising in the chair this morning. And if appropriate, Clark, just get confirmation in terms of our uh, publication and debate of the survey, or is that better at a later item? Well, for, uh, for the chair's information, the committee yeah. has agreed to publish, um, okay. but has agreed also to defer consideration of, the, um, of, of a debate just uh, pending the publication and to see what the reaction is. I think it was their feeling. Okay, well maybe I could return to that later on then under any other business. Um, should we proceed? Uh, yeah. I think the Minister may be on the line, so... Okay. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay, then, members. That right, that is... So it's agenda item two we're yep. back to. Okay, members, then. Agenda item two is the, our Ministerial and Department of Education, Education Authority, uh, oral briefing on school restart. And I refer members to your packs, which include a cover note from the clerk at page 53, the school workforce attendance survey for the 28th of September 2020 at page 69, restart related correspondence from the Department of Education, PHA and EA at page 72, committee and departmental correspondence relating to the Engage programme at page 95, 
Department, Correspondence on Support for Child Care Settings at page 126. Committee Correspondence relating to Post-Primary Transfer in 2020-21 at page 129. Committee Correspondence to SIA in respect of proposed revisions to the Curriculum and Assessment for 2020-21 at page 131. And D Guidance on School Restart at page 136. Can I remind members that the Minister is scheduled to leave at noon? So every member will have approximately seven minutes for questions and answer. Can I welcome then the Minister for Education, uh, Mr. Peter Weir, Fairies. MLA. Ivan. Mr. James <laughs> Hutchison, Restart Director, Department Dump of Education. Ms. There. Tina Dempster, Head of Child Care Strategy Team, Department of Education. Um, Mr. Dale Hanna. Director, Acting, Operations and Estates, Education Authority, and Ms. Arlene Key, Assistant Director, Youth Services, Education Authority. Can I remind all witnesses that proceedings will be reported by Hansard, uh, and by way of welcome, say, uh, thank the Minister uh, and your officials from the Department and the Education Authority for attending today. You're very welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you for making yourself available. Uh, and for the answers to queries that the committee uh, has received in respect of school restart. Obviously, when the public health situation uh, developed during the summer, we uh, had hoped uh, that the coronavirus pandemic would uh, be uh, under more control uh, than recent health st statistics suggest. Um, that uh, is obviously not the case, and there are challenging um, times ahead and important decisions uh, to be made. Minister, can I invite you therefore to make an opening statement of perhaps 10 to 15 minutes on school restart and in schools and in other settings, followed by questions from the members. Thank you. Over to you, oh, Minister. Yeah. Chair, just look, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, we're, we can't even sort of huddle together. They, there, there isn't a bit of heating in the building at the moment, so we're, we're slightly <laughs> at, at a loss. Uh, just to clarify, Chair, uh, I mean, I have opening statements on youth settings, on childcare, um, and on the broader educational restart. Do you want me to take like all three together, or do you want uh, entirely in your hands in terms of what way you want to handle this in that in that regard? Yeah, you have ten to fifteen minutes to cover all of them. Okay, well, I'll, I'll go through. I'll go through each of the elements. I'll start in terms of the um, the youth restart. I, I'll take them in the order of, of youth, childcare, and then the broader educational. Uh, the school situation. Uh, obviously, in terms of uh, youth services, um, as you indicated, uh, with each of the sections, uh, we have uh, officials that are with us, and particularly, I suppose, in terms of uh, youth restart, uh, as you indicated, I'm joined by Arlene Key, who's the assistant director for youth services, uh, who's leading on youth restart, and as most particularly of the three elements, it's probably been the one out which, which particularly, if you like, the lead organisation has been the education authority more so than the, the department in that regard. Um, so just to give you a little bit of uh, background, not only on the plans for the phased restart of generic youth services, but also give you the um, sense of the vital and exemplary work that are undertaken by our youth services, both statutory and I think in voluntary sectors. And we, we sometimes um, there's a danger always of forgetting about the great work that voluntary, voluntary sector is doing in supporting our young people this challenging time. Uh, could I say, first of all, I'd like to thank put on record my thanks to Arlene and her team and the youth workers in both voluntary and statutory sectors for ensuring that services have remained available to our young people and for responding to their needs under what are incredibly challenging circumstances. Uh, their efforts and dedication have ensured that the most vulnerable young people uh, have continued to be supported throughout the pandemic and I'm sure it would, the committee would be one with me in, in thanking our youth workers. So the public focus quite often by the media has been um, on schools uh, and I think some of the external communications might have given the impression that the work of youth service during the early stage of the pandemic and more recently the plans for youth are a, a lower priority for me and my department and that's absolutely not the case. It's symptomatic sometimes of the lack of awareness of the vital role that youth service plays within the wider education arena and something I'm keen to address. Youth service were amongst the first to operationalise an impressive and speedy response uh, in not only addressing the needs of the most vulnerable young people, including their physical and mental needs, but also ensuring that 
ongoing engagement with young people through Youth Online. This work is included um, and I think was a, of a vital addition to the payments that were, that were being made. The provision of food to those most in need through the Eat Well, Live Well programme and the fact that there has been this tried and tested programme which was able to be deployed I think was a great advantage to both the executive and society uh, more widely. Providing alternatives to antisocial and risk uh, taking behaviour and providing opportunities for young people to discuss mental health. In response to the tensions which uh, unfortunately inevitably rise during the summer period, I'd agreed also for EA to undertake again with the permission of the executive a series, uh, further series of work including individual and small group work, targeted dedicated uh, work with at risk young people that was informed by the PSNI and there was a cross sectoral working on that. The EA have also delivered the usual planned intervention programmes through uh, innovation means targeted at young people who are great at risk of becoming involved um, in sectarian activities, civil disorder or other crimes in the summer um, when there are normally heightened community tensions. And I think all of us could also appreciate in, in current circumstances that given a lot of the broader frustration that, that was out there through COVID that there was always a, a danger that temperatures could boil over at a, a much easier um, rate. I also give permission for summer youth work activities that were delivered by the voluntary community, private and uniform organisation on a voluntary basis to take place until the end of September, as long as PHA guidance was followed. That was a sense of permissiveness. All those services have undoubtedly been a lifeline to many of our young people and kept them engaged and informed. Uh, not only impacting positively on their health and well-being, but their readiness and ability to engage in both non-formal and formal education settings as these reopen. Going forward, um, further initiatives such as LINK and a programme to address non-attendance at schools are also being developed by EAU services. And uh, I suppose in terms of picking up on questions, Arlene can talk about those um, in detail later. It's also against this background, with my agreement, that EA is undertaking planning restart of generic youth services commencing uh, in October uh, on a phased basis. Working with key stakeholders, including young people, has enabled the EA uh, to understand the challenges faced by the sector directly and respond accordingly. To ensure this is done as safely as possible, comprehensive specific youth sector guidance has been produced by EA. And again, um, if there's questions in that already, it's probably in the best position to pick that up with ongoing advice um, and funding available to organisations to help them address the challenges they face. EA staff are also working on guidance to build resilience within the, the youth sector, um, living with, with COVID-19, and indeed, as part of the overall uh, wellbeing programme, there is a, a portion of the budget that is set aside for EA dealing with the youth side, of, again, while the focus has principally been on, on schools. Of course, uh, we can recognise that no guidance can cover every issue and specific questions emerge that's being addressed and the sector being informed uh, accordingly. As with other bits of guidance, this is always going to be an evolving situation. In terms of funding, um, 4.4 million is made available to the sector by EA through four support funding schemes with focus on local youth restart, emotional uh, health and wellbeing and support for the regional restart membership and regional Use, uh, restart projects. Um, the, in addition to the in recognition of these additional costs uh, incurred, um, the safe opening of youth services, my department has produced an allocation of one point, just under 1.4 million to the EA in respect of the PPE equipment for the, the youth uh, sector. Uh, Arlene, I think, will be able to add to that in response to any questions that you've got. And I know also we'll be happy to talk about uh, there's obviously been the issue in terms of the outdoor centres, which again, we can probably best picked up in questions. If I can move on then briefly, because I appreciate, I want to cover all these points at the, the start in terms of the childcare uh, sector. Um, so the committee will be aware, I suppose, of the initial actions that were taken, um, largely speaking on childcare support scheme. Um, there were two schemes to date. The initial one for the period April to June, a total of 2.8 million has been paid out from the scheme. Uh, however, there's still a, a small number of queries ongoing, so the potential there will be some additional uh, costs within that, particularly as there will be a few appeals uh, going on. Um, I think it's undoubtedly the case that there were some problems with that, that scheme, albeit that the focus of those was to provide a level of support principally to childcare settings which were closed, effectively 
which was, if you could call it a cheaper situation, but one that largely speaking was able to keep their, their head above water. Um, so lessons were learned from that, and therefore the childcare recovery program for July and August, uh, the latest update from the 10.5 million so far, and we're not obviously at a, at a finished position in terms of costs, that about 9.3 million of that has been allocated to date. Uh, and also the committee will have previously received a paper on the increase uh, of a little bit of additional funding to childminders, which is part, I think, of that overall uh, amount. Uh, at this stage, there's no further funding has been provided to the department for the period September to December. However, there's work ongoing between officials in the Department of Health and DE and childcare re sector representatives. And I think the, uh, the childcare group uh, as a whole actually has been uh, a very useful vehicle which has enabled various stakeholders to be put in uh, place on it. To try to scope out, I suppose, potentially um, what sort of what could be faced during that period. And we're continuing, obviously, to bid um, for funding um, from the, the executive. Uh, I suppose, again, there will be further tranches of money that will be made available uh, through COVID funding, but that will be a, a wider decision for the executive, so we can't uh, guarantee those. In relation to guidance and support for parents and uh, providers, obviously with childcare being something which is, while we give a policy side to it, the provision in terms of a lot of the regulations are done by the Department of Health. So Department of Health has continued to update and publish guidance in line with uh, public health advice. And again, the guidance itself is kept under continuous review. The reference group uh, is continuing to meet to ensure that information is available to parents and providers to uh, inform that. And positive case studies and reflections from parents have been shared by the reference group's members on, on social media. However, despite uh, some of this, we also know that there are child care providers who've had to close in recent weeks following confirmed cases of COVID-19 work, uh, of COVID-19, and work will continue with our health colleagues in seeking advice out of PHA uh, and issues from the child care reference groups on the operational implications. In terms of child care, I've finished by making a Brief comment on the executive childcare strategy, uh, although some information has been already uh, supplied to the committee in terms of uh, the paper we received. And, and also, I know that we've had, uh, Chair, I know wearing, I feel like, a, a dual hat, we have very good engagement with the all party group on early education and childcare to, to delve into some of these issues as well. There has been useful learning from the last few weeks, which will help share our plans for longer term when work on the strategy can, uh, can recommence. Um, and I suppose conscious that there's, that there's been a significant period has passed since the continuation on the draft childcare strategy and taking on board some of the useful learning since March, I think discussions are underway, particularly, uh, I think it would be a very helpful thing to look at in innovation labs with key stakeholders uh, early in the new year. To some extent, the exact timing will probably be um, slightly determined by the, the wider sort of health position on it, but we hope to move on that as soon as possible uh, when we get into the new year. Finally, just on the education um, restart in terms of schools. Um, so the programme is, is now well established um, to, and was established to effectively manage and process uh, to support the phased reopening of our schools. Uh, the reopening was led by medical and scientific advice and continues to do so uh, to ensure that it's done in a manner and a time scale that was safe for, for pupils, staff and wider society. Uh, the pathway to recovery followed by the route outlined in the education sector uh, of the executive approach decision making making document program worked alongside a wide range of stakeholders to co-design a series of detailed measures and guidance to provide a flexible uh, framework to engage a safe phase reopening to schools i mean it's undoubtedly been the case that um, where there's had to be a level of trade-off um, and could be criticized in a way is trying to ensure that we have as informed a guidance that is there, we consult as much as we can, while the other criticism is that things arrive late in the day. So it's a, a try to do a certain level of balance between the two. Following three restrands, um, the education uh, restart strand is considering all matters central to uh, the restart of education. So it's schools and other settings, including preschool, nurseries, AOTIS, in a safe and effective manner. The DE restart strand, which considers um, all matters central to restarting the department, including the, uh, an exit plan um, for the, the restart programme, and the lesson learned and preparedness strand, and considering that. So as part of the project, I suppose, the, um, there were a number of priorities that were identified. 
some of these are overlapping with comments made before. So it's about physical protection. It's about well-being, uh, special educational needs and vulnerable learners, the standards in learning, the new school day, which was the focus for most people, uh, and obviously the issue of childcare. Um, the Education Restart web page is now active and provides guidance and information for education settings, parents and carers and children and young people. Uh, and to ensure that, that all users can access information available, the page also signposts information uh, on partner websites such as EA and CCEA. Further to uh, this programme, uh, the programme has worked to develop a comprehensive communication plan and recognisable um, educational restart branding. So that's there to support schools. And the practitioners group in the TUS um, and sectoral body consultation group was set up in March and has regular meetings uh, throughout. The publication of revised guidance is not the end of the process. So we're in constant sort of uh, discussions. And obviously, to some extent, it's not simply what happens, broadly speaking, within education, but we will be subject in that broader sense to wider changes sometimes where helpful view things may, may differ from period to period. Um, in terms of obviously the restart guidance, um, the new school day guidance was initially published on the 19th of June um, and it always envisaged that this would be subject to uh, prevailing public medical health provision on it. It was then able to be updated in terms of a revised new school guidance on the 13th of August uh, and as indicated through it, while as part of that, then, has been, the aim has been and has been achieved where schools have been able to be brought back in full. Um, obviously, again, this is not simply a return to normal. And obviously, there's a, a number of key elements within the new school day guidance, um, which was particularly focus in on enhanced hygiene, cleaning methods, um, issues around social distancing, best spacing, protective bubbles. It's a strategic document was originally designed around a day one, but we're in a, an evolving uh, situation. Uh, in terms of testing, uh, officials have um, been liaising with DOH and PHA in relation to testing. The Department of Health and Social Care has rolled out a programme to provide COVID testing kits to all schools in England, and there's been extended arrangements that devolved administrations. Uh, that offers to every school, and there's a box of containing 10 individual home testing kits. The idea is not that we do direct testing um, on site. I think that would place our schools at this stage in terms of where we are with technology in a, a difficult uh, position. In terms of the future, the medium to longer term, um, the focus is still, um, are still likely to switch from the impact of the disruption. Uh, first of all, I think we've got to uh, assess the educational impact of loss of learning and uh, develop, if you like, uh, appropriate interventions and with the launch of the support mechanism through the ENGAGE programme, which has been funded by the department, uh, that provides that. It is also the case, which I think we're just awaiting sort of final business case sign off, that in addition to the interventions that have been planned anyway in terms of the step up on mental health and wellbeing, there's a specific funding of five million uh, that will be part of a restart um, uh, programme, which again would soon be able to announce that level of, of direct funding to schools. That's, uh, that's you know, it's undoubted. Minutes, by the way, Minister, if you want to... Okay, well, look, I've, 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 literally, I've literally got about three paragraphs to go okay. type of thing on it. I'll maybe see if there's... See, so look, we'll continue to work... Um, we'll continue to work that. I, I think, look, undoubtedly with this, um, there is always going to be a level of bumps along the road. So it's about trying to cope with where we are, trying to be... Uh, where we can scope ahead to it, where we can be responsive and uh, provide that, that information. But undoubtedly, not everything will go entirely smoothly. But I think we have seen a, a strong return uh, to schools, and I think a particular strong buy-in. I would like to place on record again my thanks, particularly to uh, to school leadership and to uh, staff within schools. But also, it's clear that there's been a strong buy-in, and a need, a desire to return to school, uh, has been shown particularly by parents and children. And I think the recognition of the importance of education. Uh, and indeed, childcare and youth settings have been acknowledged, particularly by the department. And so, uh, to take one example, um, we were, it was accepted by the executive that when particular measures were being put in place uh, in the Northwest, that this was on the basis then of schools remaining open, childcare remaining open, 
and also that support for uh, managed uh, youth settings also to be supported, given the importance of youth settings. So, sorry, I appreciate I've gone a little bit over, over time, but as you appreciate with three subjects, there's quite, quite a lot to cover, but we'll be happy, myself and the team here will be happy to answer, um, answer the, the, the questions. Okay. Chair. Thank you, Minister. Um, and echo your acknowledgement of the role played by um, teachers, non-teaching staff, parents, pupils across Northern Ireland in, in getting our, our education system restarted. Um, obviously, key to school restart will be and, and control of, of the transmission of coronavirus in our schools and therefore our community will be prompt and efficient response to uh, symptomatic and COVID positive cases, isolation of those cases, contact tracing and testing. So can I ask how many teachers are, uh, have been and are COVID positive? Uh, Chair, we're working on data think the meetings yesterday in relation with PHA. PHA would have any of the direct figures in, in relation to this. I think they're working with us so they can provide the figures to both ourselves and to to the education committee in as accurate and a fair a way uh, as possible because I think we don't want to be giving either inaccurate figures or misleading figures. PHA have that level up. Now what we do have, we know that in terms of the figures because there are surveys of uh, both children that are in, in school and teachers that are directly in school and there has been um, within that, um, you know, we, we've had a very strong um, response in terms of the number of children that have been in and indeed the number of teachers have been in. Again, as part of this, because some, uh, what we do know as well from PHA has been that where community transition, transmission has taken place, it may well have had a knock-on effect in terms of schools where either a child uh, has got it or a member of staff has got it. Largely speaking, I think PHA are confident that there has not been significant levels of transmission within schools. Okay. But for example, where you've, where you've had a teacher who has tested positive, it has sometimes been the case that from a social point of view, maybe some of the restrictions will then limit this further. Okay. It has then perhaps been, what has been vulnerable has been some of their colleagues who've then had to self-isolate as a result okay. of that. But okay. PHA are working on figures at present okay. because you'll, we want to provide appreciate. something that's very Mr. accurate. Mr. Minister, you'll appreciate we've got a raft of questions to get through here. So no, I understand. We're going to have to keep answers uh, concise. So do, okay. do, do you know how many teachers are have been and are COVID positive? No, we, we'll get you the figures once PHA are in a position to have you release that in a meaningful way. Figures? Do you not need to know that well, no, we, look, we, we, look. What I told you we're working. We're working with PHA. PHA. There are PHA figures in that regard. There is no point in releasing okay. figures which may be inaccurate in their in their nature. And it's it's a situation where that that is something which evolves uh, okay, so evolves I, every day. I, I presume then you don't know either then how many P seven teachers are um, are COVID positive. No. Well, okay. from that point of view, frankly, if if we're, if we're going to get you the figures, we'll, uh, you know, there's no point then trying to. If we're saying actually from a PHA point of view, we're working with them so those can be yep. presented in a very accurate manner yeah. and a useful yeah. manner to be, both the committee be, and more uh, and more generally on it. We're not we're not going to drill down into individual no, uh, be, classes in that regard. No, I pr appreciate that and, and, and we'll look forward to receiving those. Part of the question is genuine to ask if, if, if you have asked and if you know and it's slightly concerning if you if well, you if you haven't. Um, well, with respect on it, we are we are meeting in terms of the detail of that, we are meeting on a very regular basis, and indeed officials were meeting yesterday, for instance, as part of that, with PHA and the Department of Health. So okay. we would provide the figures. And okay. I'm not okay. going to get into, uh, if, you know, if we're not in the position to release the figures, we're not going to get into levels of then trying to drill down into detail. Down. Okay, so you, you, you don't Bring know how down. many teachers, for example, have been or are self-isolating either then? Well, again, that would be a, sort of a variable, um, variable piece and there's the opportunities for um, substitute teachers to be on. That's where part of the funding is uh, within that. Look, these numbers will vary from, from day to day and indeed part of the disruption that had happened in a couple of schools was on the basis of the impact not on children but on teachers so it took a day or two to be able to, to put in place and indeed there's been some schools where they've taken an action of either closing a form or closing a school and uh, sometimes that has been because there's been a day or two where they've taken to actually, particularly where it's hit on, for instance, say a school principal or a vice principal, where 
there's, if you like, been a break in the chain of, of leadership, and consequently they've had to put in place okay. uh, within that. But we've worked with those schools within okay. that. But I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to get into the, the figures until uh, PHA are in a position to be able okay. to provide those in an accurate way, rather than uh, try to sort of uh, deal okay. with sort of okay. detail, so, which, which okay. they have there. So you, so you, you won't know either then how many pupils um, have been in self-isolation either then? Well, we know from the point of view of the levels of attendance that are there, which are varied between uh, the, the normal normal process in terms of because uh, where pupils have been um, absent, normally sort of the overall pupil attendance for on an annual basis, and uh, I think part of the stuff in terms of entirely comparing like with like up until now in previous years, those figures have been captured on an annual basis. I mean, around about 94, 95 percent. The overall pupil attendance has varied between about, I think it was about 91.3% and 95.5%. We, we monitor those on a weekly basis. Uh, and similarly, I think the, uh, the level of teachers that have been in have been hitting around about 95%. And there's a normal uh, element of uh, teachers being missing on a, uh, you know, on a normal basis in terms of other elements. So those are probably the more most relevant figures uh, within that, right? Okay. And again, it's it's part of part of that. I suppose is also to try to ensure that that in terms of the latest advice that is there from from PHA in terms of the people that should be self isolating, that that is obviously schools will also have a certain level of flexibility as to what they do in particular circumstances. But there's yeah. clear guidance okay. on who should be self isolating when when okay. there are particular cases. Okay. So close close contacts with um, COVID positive cases, for example, are required to self isolate for 14 days. That's you know two weeks of school being missed. So you you, you, well, no, you don't know. But how in, circumstances, are in circumstances, in circumstances where school. in circumstances, uh, sorry, that that's again just saying it will mean that those people will not be in school. Yeah. But where there are where the where yes, but in the same basis of, as uh, during the uh, the spring term, where there were gaps um, within that because pupils were at school, then there's an onus on schools to ensure that, that they are providing uh, remote learning for those children. So it's it's, but I think everyone will accept, which is one of the reasons I think why all of us are of a view that uh, the more that we can ensure that school is as regular and as normal as possible, remote learning is still never as as um, uh, as good as being the directly within the, the classroom itself. But close, yes, close contacts are defined within the, the PHA guidance, which is out there with, with schools. So, uh, you know, barring some very unusual set of circumstances, we shouldn't really be in a position, for instance, where we're seeing whole schools close, unless it's for a day or two for the likes of a, a deep clean or to try to reorganize staff or something of that nature. No, but we, we as of today, you're not even able to tell us to what extent school is being affected in terms of attendance? Well, we, like, we, can get you, like, we can get to the figures in terms okay. of what the overall school attendance are. Like, the point is, you can plug out a figure of the number of schools that on any one particular occasion or any over a period of time will it some way have impact. But that impact might be, here's one child who is off, or it could be, here's a whole form that is off. So it's about actually ensuring that the, the data that is able to be provided is done so in a meaningful manner. I suppose if you're looking at a global level on that, um, the variations in terms of patterns of attendance um, are probably the, the, the critical aspect as regards, uh, and those have been relatively close. They've been a little bit below what the normal figures are likely to be, although we can't make a complete like-for-like -like comparison, but it shows that the vast majority of schools, the vast majority of children are still in. One would anticipate that even under normal circumstances, you would probably have a higher level of absentee rate or absence um, okay. in, during okay. an autumn term than necessarily you would have to in the summer or not. To, we need to move on, Minister, but you, you can't have okay. expected that you were going to come to the Education Committee today and the Education Committee wasn't going to ask you for a, a detailed brief on the nature of school attendance or school absence or the COVID positive um, rate and the committee, of the committee, the committee, the committee, committee is The committee is entitled, obviously, to ask anything it wants in relation it's, to that. Okay. But what I think we have an onus on working with PHA because the PHA will have uh, the figures as regards that is to ensure then that whenever figures are supplied, they are absolutely accurate. They are something which are of value to both the committee and to others as well. And I okay. think that. Okay. Are you, are you but, okay. content with Point the level of assistance that schools are getting to do quite significant scales of contact tracing as a result of COVID positive and symptomatic well, not, cases? Sorry, the, the, the point is that. that the process is that where somebody is tested positive, it is then the school 
has got to then draw up a list of those who have been in close contact. Close contact is very clearly defined uh, yeah. within that now. I, I don't need a detailed uh, break. And, and, and then, and then they will pass, it, and then they will pass that on. Content with the assistance that schools are getting to do it. Well, with respect, the idea is that the schools themselves will be able to determine who a close contact is. It is their role then to pass that on to PHA, and for PHA then to do the contract to chasing so themselves. Schools are it's doing not it themselves. Schools are having to do this themselves, Minister. They're they're conducting contact tracing, and are are you content that with no, the no, scale they're, of they're, workload they're, that that's sorry, required? They're, 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 they're able to draw up the contract tracing list. In terms of the testing yeah. side of things, that's with PHA, and I think right. you know there's a delineation yeah, there's no of rules that are there. Okay. All right. That's no, good. Um, but quickly, in terms of clinically vulnerable children and children with clinically vulnerable um, members at home, um, the, the clinically vulnerable children, school restart guidance stated that they would get uh, assistance from a health professional um, with regards to whether it was suitable for them to return to school. Do you know how many children are in this category? Are they largely at special schools? What percentage of them are awaiting assessment? Um, what support are they getting if they can't attend school? So are, are, are these clinically yeah, children, well, vulnerable this, children this is, this is getting the, the health group. assistance they need to be either be at school or to receive assistance at home? Well, look, we're, we're working with, with health and that deal, do you think? Um, <clears throat> Chair, I think the only figure I can give you around that are those children who require um, aerosol generating procedures. So this week there's still 18 pupils um, that we're still working on trying to get into school. The, the, the vast majority of those are in special education schools. And the figure last week was 23, so we're working our way through it and it's coming down. But I don't have a figure for the, the other uh, medical conditions. And the position, the position, broadly speaking, as, as regards to special schools is that while and it is the normal situation, very understandably, that school attendance at special schools would tend to be overall at a bit of a lower level than would be within mainstream schools. Again, I think it's running at around about 2% below what it would normally be on that, on that side of things. Okay, and in terms of children uh, that have a clinically vulnerable um, family member at home um, who were to have a risk assessment um, in order to return to school, it's my understanding that health is not um, required to assist with that risk assessment. How has that situation um, worked out? Well, look, we'll be working with health to try to do, if there's any outstanding issues, resolve those. Right, okay. Um, in terms of post-primary transfer, Minister, um, do you accept that there's been fairly widespread rejection of your January rescheduling of, of transfer tests? I'm not quite sure where this fits into restart in that, in that regard, but if you want to ride that hobby horse, happy to do so. Look, the reality is there's a balance to be struck. First of all, it is not in terms of dates. I want to make this absolutely clear, and you're very well aware of this, I'm sure. The dates are set by the transfer test providers. They are not an issue directly for the department. Our role is to ensure that whenever transfer in whatever form, and this applies both to those who are taking the test and those that are not, is that from that point then we are able to process working alongside our colleagues within EA to ensure then that, that that can happen in a timely manner which can ensure that everybody is in place for their new school, for the new school okay. term. I'm happy for you to and say I think you that, know, that if, point if, is you, if you disagree with the question that I'm asking rather than give a, a long answer. Um, but I'm, I'm obviously going to ask the, the questions. You, I mean, it's my understanding that you had drafted a ministerial direction um, for EA to change their timetable around post-primary no, transfer what, administration. What, so I what, find it what, hard how what, having what, no what role in this process stacks up sorry, to that. Our, our role... As you know from the court case, uh, we indicated we explored with EA whether, first of all, whether uh, any time, what timetables were doable in that regard, because there's no point, uh, while the choice ultimately is for the test providers, there's no point in any timetable being provided which simply cannot be processed. It became clear from that that we were in a position uh, that tests could either happen um, on a time scale before Christmas or shortly after Christmas as a result of that. Now, the key role, irrespective of anything, is to ensure that we can, we can uh, ensure that every child is processed and appeals able to, to take place as well, okay. so that they can happen, so that we are not left okay. in the academic year with people being. And that, 
that is right thing. Okay. The choice in terms of the dates, the, 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 reality, the reality is whatever dates are there, it is incumbent on us and the EA to ensure that there is delivery of that. Understand. Uh, okay. But, okay. And so the process is going to have to be nine weeks faster than normal. What What is the additional cost for that nine weeks uh, shorter uh, time scale? Well, no, actually, I don't. You're, I think you're inaccurate in terms of your, your figures. I think it's actually about a six week uh, period okay. in six relation weeks. to that. Thanks for the correction. And six weeks. And of that, sorry, of that, where they think, and there will be some changes which are going to be happening anyway in EA in terms of the, the digitalization of the of the process, okay, so which no will be cost. there. Of that, of that, and of that time frame, um, I think from that there are effectively the change from an EA, call it wider educational point of view, is effectively five weeks because, in terms of turnaround from the test yeah. providers, which without this happening, I think time frames would not have been able to be met, is on the basis of. Um, them actually taking a shorter period of time for the processing of the tests themselves okay. by so no, no additional to cost to the public purse no, there, for there, this. There will, be, <coughs> there, 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 there will be some level of additional cost in trying to make sure that, that things move uh, more rapidly. Some of those things were things that were going to be happening anyway in, in relation to that. Okay. But to be honest on it, the more that we can make this the more that we can make the more that we can make this a process to which things move as, as quickly and as seamlessly as possible, I think that's in everyone's interest. Okay. And that is true, to be perfectly honest. Whether you're doing the test, whether you're not doing the test, the important thing is to actually move P7 okay. pupils on to year eight in as seamless okay. a way as possible. Okay, and schools who have decided to not use academic selection in their admissions process, is, do you believe that's a significant change? <coughs> We are finalising advice, having taken some legal advice in relation to that. So I think that, that um, the information on that, I think, will be made clear to those schools uh, fairly shortly in that regard. And uh, I, I think there's, you know, so that, that will become clear. But because we've taken a level of legal advice, I think the schools themselves should be informed of the situation before there's any other action. Uh, when, taken. When, when did you receive the legal advice? Well, we've got that. There was certain actions then that we have had to take on foot of the legal advice, which we're just finalising. So I would anticipate the, that we would probably be in a position to be able to clarify the situation with the schools probably within the next week or so. So within the next week, you will be telling the schools whether or not you think that's a significant change? Yes, that, that would be the, the, the intention. That is, we're working through the final elements of that at present on it, but as I said, as it's on the foot of legal advice, and I think as there's maybe been uh, a couple of cases where the issue is a little bit greyer than, than others, we're having to work through those, but we'd be in a position, I think, within that chair to be able to give that information okay. uh, within the next week or so. I think if, if you deem it to be a significant change, then there are obviously a string of extremely serious questions to answer um, that we would wish to return to. Um, further to publication of that legal advice, but I, I won't go down that road today. Well, from, from, from that point of view, it's obviously hypothetical at this stage, so we'll see what it uh, transpires there. Okay, can I bring in Karen Mullen, Deputy Chair? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Minister Dale, Arling and Tina for attending this morning. I have two, uh, first of all, all, I have two questions in relation to the Youth Service, so I'll put them together. Um, and I also want to commend the ex excellent ongoing work um, through the Youth Service at the Education Authority and our community and voluntary sector provision. Um, the first one is, Minister, you, you give an outline and update there in relation to generic youth services uh, on a phase-based uh, approach in October and uh, attempts to reopen. In, in relation to Derry and Straban and the new restrictions, will that be the same for Derry and Straban? Um, sorry. Uh, sorry, no, maybe, maybe you want to get the other question out first. Yeah, right. the, the other one's just a wee quick one. We had um, correspondence on from the Uniform uh, Youth Work Hub. Uh, they are unclear in relation to guidance um, and are asking for clarity around educational visits. Have they been paused to outdoor and residential settings? Okay, let, let me deal with the, the two aspects. I think that the situation in Derry and Straban may not be absolutely identical, but should be similar. I made it 
very clear that youth services, whenever we were just, uh, don't want to breach too much directly, of, but I think it was accepted by everybody on the executive that when we were looking at the protections that had to be put in place and the call it exemptions from restrictions that were there, going to be there in education and childcare, this should also cover managed youth settings within uh, Derry and Strabane because I think it's, it's also the case that um, uh, that it's not just, if you like, a localised issue there. You know, what happens in the first instance may well be replicated in, in other locations. And I think everybody within the executive accepted the importance of, of youth settings. So the position, I think, in terms of the guidance is that, that uh, managed youth settings, I think, is, uh, would, be, would be called. I think that can cover, broadly speaking, a fairly generic um, definition of that are within those things that are. So from that point of view, I don't believe there should be any major difference Specifically, as regards the um, uh, the outdoor centres and the educational visits, we had worked out. I think on initially the suggestion was that these would resume from January. I felt that that was too far away, and so it, I've given indications to um, EA that those should resume by the end of October. That is subject. The only thing that was particularly subject to would be, um, which we're still awaiting a final verdict from uh, from PHA and and DOH. I think the other factor. That members should be aware of. We are keen to get those um, resumed. The, the association of um, uh, of education centres, a or the exact acronym. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, that operate in the four nations of the of the United Kingdom. They are looking at an overall suggestion towards January, but we would like to see that resumed here at an earlier stage. But that would be dependent upon getting a green light from and to do so at the end of October, a uh, green light from getting from PHA, Health and Chief Medical Officer. I don't know if Arlene is anything you want to add just in, in relation to that. That's a, a good summary. Um, Karen, in terms of the youth providers in Derry and Strabane, we met at six o'clock on the evening that uh, the new restrictions were put in place to scenario build, problem solve, give guidance and advice. <laughs> And uh, the voluntary and community sector are very clear that they want to support vulnerable children and young people. They want to meet the needs of um, those young people. And we have very good processes in place of ongoing support scenario planning um, to enable that sector to progress. The same stands for our own statutory services. So we are standing up services this week and we are... Um, ensuring that our young people are protected. There were two key things that were important to take on board. One, parents felt that in Derry and Strabane, some of the community sector and some of the council provision was closed, so why should youth service be open? And there was a bit of a concern around the visibility of that, and we have addressed that now, and we are, um, we've provided a pack for parents so that they understand that children are safe that we are about, as the Minister says, um, education and ensuring that personal social development and our programmes are central to that work. So I feel that we've both got the provision in place to ensure there's ongoing guidance and advice and that uh, we are um, ensuring that young people are provided for in your area. Uh, we're, we're conscious said, that youth, youth services cannot simply be a, a forgotten element or a, a seen as a sort of something just to, to the side, you know, in relation to the provisions that are made. Of course, Minister, and it's good to see that you brought Arlene along today because I think the sector has been feeling for a long time and it, it, we, it was rectified um, a while back. Maybe just that a lot of um, the planning was going on the, the schools and rightly so at the time. So there's been great work done um, by Arlene and her team. And it's, you know, it is young people have missed out in so much. So it's good to hear it's been managed in a safe way and, and we can try and provide services as if to do so. So thank you both for that update. Minister, I suppose Chris, the chair, has covered um, quite a bit, but I just want to go back on some of the stuff. This is all quite um, moving very fast, um, and particularly I've touched on Derry and Strabane. And at the same time, we're continuing to see sporadic school closures and the withdrawal of pub class bubbles and more and more 
pupil self-isolating. Um, you, you, we talked there, Chris had asked about the figures, and it's difficult for us to sort of um, see the level when but the recent update that's been provided is the 14th of September from your department in terms of attendance. My own daughter, who is in year 12, is off for the third time, now uh, isolating for 14 days. She is a pupil minister who has had 100% attendance throughout her whole school life, and you can imagine how worried and concerned we are. And this has been replicated right across. Um, so again, it's around, uh, particularly very concerned around the prospect of the GCSEs and the A levels for next year um, and the uncertainty that that's going to bring. Um, Minister, we are now in our second month. What work is ongoing in relation to remote learning and ensuring that there is a level playing field for young people? And you know that I've been raising this from, from March in relation to being connected and there's been great work done by the department but yesterday i've been told that one of our local post-primary schools has submitted their request for laptops and they're still waiting two weeks so that means that some children at home isolating without access to learning we need contingency planning ramped up in this regard and for your department must ensure that a quality of access to the curriculum for all young people. So there's two parts to that. I already asked you the first part, sorry. And the second part is, will you look at widen the criteria to the IT equipment support um, uh, from the criteria that's there at the minute? Because we do have many parents um, who are still on furlough, incomes reduced, and more and more parents will be coming um, maybe losing jobs or uh, you know less income coming on the house. We have already seen that, and particularly um, in my own area. So sorry about that long wonder, but hopefully okay, look, look, they're happy to sort of the amount of devices that, that having. But look, if there's a specific problem at a school, uh, Karen, if, if you want to notify us, we'll, we'll chase that up. We're also, I think, in discussions um, actually this week via some contacts we've had, which could hopefully widen the pool of uh, of. Devices, but again, uh, there'll be discussions in the next few days in relation to that. Look, you're right in terms of um, the broader issue about trying to ensure then that, uh, particularly for, um, uh, <laughs> particularly, particularly for, uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose it's, it's appropriate we're dealing with the challenges of technology here at this point on that, on that side of things. Um, no, the. I think there's a couple of issues in relation to that as well. So the, there's the issue of remote devices, which we're looking to see if we can widen the, the scope of. Uh, I think as part of that as well, there's also been uh, an additional thing, business case put in to see with, with DOF, to see if, if some capital can be shifted further into uh, digital devices um, as well in, in connection with that. Uh, it is also the point that um, I think one of the challenges where I think we've had to drill down a bit with schools and in terms of the PHA advice has been, understandably, there's also been a reaction where, where sometimes schools have seen a case to um, fill the net very wide in terms of those who are, who are self-isolating, whereas the advice it should be, um, sometimes should be a little bit more um, limited, if you like, the number of, of children that are, and I suppose we're working with schools in relation to that and hopefully uh, drawing that, that back in uh, as well. But look, there's no doubt that there will be a level of a disruption. And I suppose we're trying to ensure then that there are, you know, that level of support where we can uh, we can manage it. But I mean, it's, it's it will be, you're right, it will be bumpy. I appreciate the position that your daughter is in. And that will also mean, I think, that whenever a uh, decision will be taken around, uh, which again, we finalise in the next few days on some of the issues around, particularly the GCSE and A-level side, but there's a, a level of scope that's put in place that we can't expect, uh, or at least it's not unreasonable for the most part to expect the level of content which would be covered in a normal year to necessarily be reflected. Yeah, we're, we're in danger of taking far too long here in, in, in our okay. um, Karen, you content there? Just one last one, Chair, if you don't mind. It needs to be very brief. Before you do, Minister, how many laptops have been given out? And if you don't know the answer, that's fine, just say. But that, I think that's what Karen is trying to get I think, I think, because I think there was a question, I think the question that Karen had put in talked about that there'd been, I 
think off the top of my head, I think about about six thousand seven hundred. Oh, sorry, Dale. Dale. Dale apparently has. Um, so, look, what what I have some information here in front of me. What I can say is, in total for stage three, we have seven and a half thousand devices have been allocated across the system. When you yeah. say allocated, does that mean given the schools? Uh, uh, I, I think I think the figures I think the figures in terms of it have been directly distributed was somewhere in the region of about six thousand seven hundred. I can't remember the exact the exact figure, but I know that yesterday because I think Karen had put in a very similar written question yeah. and was signed off on yesterday. So I think yeah. there was um, you know those that have been obtained those okay. have been allocated. There's a small gap between the two, but yeah. okay. I'd say about ninety percent roughly have been. Okay. Uh, but we're, again, we're, we're looking to we're see. Danger of being way uh, over time. Karen, a very okay. very brief supplementary, please. And, and just really, um, I suppose we've maybe gathered it from the answers that we've been given so far, and I have touched on the situation in Derry and Stravan, and it's just really to find out, Minister, what extra support that your department has given in Derry and Stravan, the local school leaders, to be able to deal with um, the restrictions and high levels of people off and isolating. Well, I mean, don't forget, it, it'll have to be across the board, because w where we are within that area will be to some extent a little bit of a variation of what's happening in other areas, other areas will come up in relation to so there will be sort of there is I suppose more general support. Don't forget it's also the case that in terms of schools themselves um are to remain open and that's it. And that's something which I think to be fair is probably fairly generic across all jurisdictions. Uh, you know, if you look south, you look um, east, you'll find the sort of similar position. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Karen. Robin Newton MLA. Thank you, Chair, and again, thank the Minister for, for coming to, to the committee. And can I also thank you, Minister, for you uh, reacting positively from uh, requests from boards of governors and indeed uh, principals to visit uh, schools in East Belfast. That's greatly appreciated, I know, by those uh, principals and the boards of governors. I do want to say thank you. Uh, I think we should put place on record from, from all members of the committee. Uh, our thanks to the principals uh, and indeed all the principal staff uh, working in partnership with parents uh, and indeed enabling the, uh, the successful return uh, to schools. From a personal note, I certainly do want to echo your words, Minister, on the work of the youth services. I, I, I applaud the, the work that they have done over, over this uh, very difficult uh, situation. But Minister, I, I have had uh, discussions with uh, principals and vice principals, um, uh, and those have been around the increasing amount of work that the principals or vice principals or senior staff are having to do with uh, those children who have missed out on the protective uh, environment of a school over the, the, the period of, of the lockdown and the return. Can I ask about the, the relationship or a developing or emerging or, or an additional relationship uh, indeed that I would believe is necessary to support the principals uh, in addressing the, the difficult situation of some some young young children, um, and indeed, is there an emerging or developing relationship with uh, health uh, in in addressing the, the needs of those children, Minister? Well, I suppose speaking in terms of addressing needs, um, we've had if you like the two interventions, one of which is now ruled out, the other will soon be there. Uh, the specific in terms of academic needs, obviously through the Engage programme, which is about 11.2 million, that followed on from smaller initiatives over the summer. But obviously the big concerns out there, and I've also met, as well as meeting at times with principals, um, also met with some groups, for example, the likes of Action Mental Health, um, and in terms of some specific needs, uh, also uh, earlier this week with, for example, Guide Dogs to the Blind. So there's a range of specific groups within that. We're looking, I think, fairly shortly, I think we've just got to get the final business case signed off of uh, that £5 million um, recovery uh, programme on mental health and wellbeing, which I think impacts in very considerably on some of the needs that have been there within that. There's obviously a role for health as well. That will also work alongside a range of initiatives that are being considered in terms of the, the wider um, mental health and wellbeing framework, which would be something that would be mainstream uh, to the number of years. We're keen to work with individuals. I know, um, I think relatively soon, Robin, 
specifically as regards East Belfast. I know I'll be meeting, I think, with a group of principals there uh, relatively shortly, and I was down in the diary that as well. I was thinking, uh, Chairman, uh, sorry, Minister, in terms of the um, family intervention teams and the relationship between the schools and, and the family intervention teams, where the indication uh, given to me by the principals is that finding more and more that they need to spend time on these issues and seeking a greater involvement, a stronger involvement uh, with the family intervention teams and the school? Well, if we, if, we can, if we can be a conduit to being able to facilitate that better relationship, we'll be happy to do so. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Robin. Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Minister. It's good to see Dio, Arlene and uh, Tina, and I too would like to very quickly put on record my sincerest appreciation to Arlene and her team for the great work that she is doing uh, and her team is doing for youth services across Northern Ireland and for the assistance that has been kindly offered to me as the Assembly Member for West Huron uh, in recent times, and the same with Dio's office as well, who's assisted with me over the last few weeks. I just want to thank you both uh, directly. Uh, Minister, I'll, ju I'll jump straight into the questions. Uh, the Engage uh, money was allocated according to a formula devised by your department. Uh, are you aware that this formula managed to allocate two primary schools in the same small town the same amount of money? One school has almost three times the enrolment of the other and has close to a 20 per cent higher social deprivation rate. One school is 250 pupils, the other is 750 pupils. Uh, the, the net result is that the school can spend the equivalent of slightly over £100 per uh, child, while the other has £36 per child. Would you uh, tell us uh, how both schools, Minister, can equally address the ravages of COVID-19 on their respective children with such uh, differentiating budgets? And might I add that this is not the only example uh, that I could quote from the numbers throughout Northern Ireland. Your allocation of funding is driven with Similar discrepancies, Minister, right across the country, and children will not be supported fairly as a consequence. Do you agree that the formula is a mess? No, it's a short answer. We get the phrase right. I was going to say uh, it's it's good to see you back in the, the flesh, and uh, look, uh, there may well be some administrative error because, in terms of the way the banding works, in terms of the numbers with the uh, engaged program, I'm not. I don't believe that a uh, figure where a school is 250 and one is 750, uh, particularly if they're both in the same position as roughly speaking as regards free school meals, etc., should be the uh, should be the same. So that sounds like maybe be, there's maybe been an error uh, within that. The position, I suppose, was that we had um, levels of banding where, first of all, there was a higher figure went to schools that had above the average free school meals entitlement, which is uh, 28%, and then it was banded within that uh, on the basis of the size of the schools. Similarly, I think for those so that there was not, uh, schools were not left entirely without support. For those that were below the average in terms of um, preschool meals, um, the, the position uh, was such that uh, it should be like, yeah, sorry, there would be, sorry, there would be corrected a little bit, sorry, in terms of the banding, yeah, look, there will be a, an allocation that, that is there. You know, the reality is that this is actually then to provide levels of uh, support that can be out there. We could have spent a lot longer devising a scheme, but the idea was to get a sort of money out to schools as quickly as possible, and therefore a banding system, which is something which is happens in a uh, number of other cases, uh, will be the case. This is additional support that is there, and the freedom is given to the schools to be able to supply that money. So I don't, I don't believe that uh, that is a, a level of mess. It will mean that whatever system you put in place can always be argued to be fair to some than others. There's no perfect uh, solution in, in relation to that. But this is actually a way of, of getting that money out directly to, uh, to schools in a way which they can spend that quickly on that level of additional intervention and substitute cover. Uh, Minister, uh, first of all, thank you for your well wishes and, and uh, as well for them when I was off. I'm sure that you've missed me. <laughs> uh, but in, in terms of uh, the points words, that you've raised. Words, words cannot describe how much I've, I've missed you, Danny. I, I, would, say, I would say that. Uh, in terms of the figures that you've raised, I, I am familiar with the particular schools that I have raised. I'll not name them, but the, 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 one of them uh, uh, has a, a social deprivation rate much lower than the other, and it just incidentally turns out to be 
the school with the smaller numbers of people. So I'm just wondering, because I have looked through the figures and I've used my own constituency because of my own local knowledge, as to how a school with 750 pupils can get the same level of funding as a school with 250 pupils, but when it comes down to per head or pupil number, uh, there's a massive contrast. Uh, and I know that the school uh, with 250 pupils has a lesser rate of social <coughs> deprivation, a lesser rate of free school meals uh, than that of the uh, uh, much larger primary school. And I know that this issue is going to be raised with me because I have raised it at this committee uh, in previous weeks uh, as well, that this would be the case. Well, because, Daniel, in relation to that, we wanted something which could get money to schools quickly. We wanted a formula which was uh, both had a level of sense. Sorry, I should correct something I said, said earlier. In terms of the bandings on the free school meal entitlement side of things, yes, there is a banding which is above 200, uh, which then goes up to 1,000. The idea was to provide particular blocks of money where schools could then, for example, get the equivalent of one full-time equivalent or half a full-time equivalent, rather than have 8,000 different rates of doing that. There'll also be different bits. So we took the differentiation bit of saying there would be a higher level of funding to schools that qualified, and this is quite often... Um, the case within government funding that you pass a qualification threshold and then receive a certain amount of money. It was on the basis of where there was above average free school meal entitlement uh, and above average free school meal entitlement would be schools that would have 28% or more that would be of a, a higher bit. Now that was something in terms of, for example, whenever signature project was ruled out a number of years ago, where it was then concentrated on those schools um, where they, they had a higher level of, of free school meal entitlement. And so you would get some level of disparity or, or anomalies, but this was to ensure then there was a level of support got to everyone. I think one of, the criticism, one, of, one of the criticisms that was there previously was the schools that fell below that 28% or below average free school meals were getting nothing. So we have a lower banded uh, level of support, which can then mean that that creates to levels of equivalent numbers of additional substitute cover or additional amount of intervention that can still take place in areas where there's a, uh, a lower level of um, social deprivation. Uh, Minister, I appreciate your answer and, and, uh, and I also appreciate that there is funding that has been allocated to schools, but I have concern, I haven't got time to continue on this today, but I have concern that two primary schools in my local area uh, with significant difference in numbers will receive, one school will receive £100 per head, which is significant compared to the £36 per head. And I don't know how I'm going to justify or explain that to the principal of each individual school who have the same circumstances uh, to tackle but have much larger numbers to deal with. And I just think that, Minister, I think the, the, I think the, 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 only, the only alternative to them would be a bespoke solution for all 1,000 schools in Northern Ireland where they would all be receiving different amounts. You would have an argument about to what extent do you provide waiting for free school meals in terms of social deprivation in, within that formula. To what extent then do you reflect the numbers that, that are there? And to be able to get something which would then be in place to enable schools to start spending that from um, actually towards the end of September onwards, if you were going to be devising a scheme uh, which simply was effectively bespoke for each school, realistically, we'd actually be waiting. But, but, You'd be trying to get something which we, wouldn't we be in place for the, this we, we appreciate the complexity of the situation and the challenges that COVID has gave, but I'm just simply pointing out a, a very simple fact that's going to be fired at each of us very quickly in our respective constituencies, or indeed as our spokesperson's roles would include. I just think that the two bans uh, that have been considered uh, on this occasion are much too crude, uh, and they're going to disproportionately well, affect one school over are, the other. Are, strictly, but, strictly speaking, with free school meals, there are four separate bans in terms of numbers. Uh, there's then sorry, the separate bit in sorry. terms. What oh, sorry? Sorry, the number four band rather than two would have been much better. That's what I was to say. Okay. There, there, there are a total of four bands within the yeah. preschool meal okay. bits, and then four three more within within the um, final question. Yeah. Within the the, the non preschool meal bit, so effectively you could say there's equivalent of seven bands. Look, I think if you were to start to disaggregate that a lot more, as I said, you would you would, and again. If you have any, you, you either have a situation where you have something that's bespoke for every school or you have some level of banding. Um, if you have some level of banding, you're always going to get a level of criticism that where people will fall just either side of the, the band. They've seen this, this happening. If you're going to do something which is bespoke, which works a sort of certain formula in, in, in relation to that, then I think in devising that, administering it, okay. and sending so it out, we'll, we'll, I think we'll come you know, back I think it's proper. But the point is being made.
th th thank you, Minister, and, and again, I do appreciate it is a complicated situation. I just want to uh, touch on the uh, CIA stuff, uh, uh, as I have been. Uh, DE has recently provided correspondence to the Committee, uh, which we appreciate, uh, uh, regard, including CIA's advice to you, Minister, uh, on yep. the 5th of the 4th. Uh, 2020 in respect of uh, grade awarding options. CA's recommendations in respect of GCSEs, AS and A levels appear to match the grade awarding models which were adopted prior to the 17th of August 2020. It is understood minister, that, that, that you, Minister, provided a second formal direction to CA on the 12th of the 5th 2020. In this regard, can you, Minister, confirm that this direction required CA to adopt the recommended grade awarding models for GCSEs, AS and A levels which were later abandoned on the 17th of August 2020? And if these grading models were decided upon by you, Minister, in May, why were they not published or shared with this committee or indeed anyone else prior to the 17th of August 2020? And finally, Minister, why has your department directed SEA not to pay examiners, moderators and invigilators? And have you directed SEA to repay all exam fees? A number of things in there, Minister, but mainly about the okay. advice okay. received. I think that's a critical point because we need to know and establish who was directing who when it came to the awarding that caused a huge amount of hurt to students and teachers. I got advice, I got advice from, from SIA in terms of, as indeed did other ministers in, in other jurisdictions, I got advice from SIA in terms of what the models should be, in terms of the awarding models for uh, A-levels, AS-levels and GCSE. Uh, as in other jurisdictions, um, I took that advice, I agreed with that advice. From the point of view of directing, ultimately I'm the person who takes responsibility, I take the decision. Directing maybe gives an impression that uh, that something I did was contrary to what SIA's advice is, so it was not a question of me imposing something on SIA. I take uh, responsibility for that because the reality is that any solutions we're going to come up with are not going to be perfect in connection with that. In terms of the, we took legal advice on the, um, on your other issue in terms of the uh, financing of examiners. Well, I should say, first of all, in terms of any issues on um, any reimbursement towards students or schools, uh, there's yet to be advice, final advice received in, in connection with that. But specifically on the examiner's side of it, examiners have been paid for the work that they have done. We got legal advice which indicates that in terms of examiners, in terms of invigilators, moderators, and indeed anybody providing that, that there is a effectively a contract for services that if you like, payment should only be there where those services have been provided. So people have been provided for all the preparation work which took place um, in connection that legally um, we'd be in a situation where we're paying people where there's no entitlement to that money with the work uh, because of circumstances out there control has not been uh, done. Uh, and also in circumstances in which to do that, I think the, the initial suggestion was a particular group at the top of examiners, about 1,600 examiners be paid and others not. Legally, that would be indefensible, and we've got advice out of the Department of Solicitor's Office in terms of the way forward. That advice pointed to a direction that legally the safest option from a point of view any form of challenge was uh, that groups should be treated equally and indeed that there wasn't a legal entitlement for anybody to be paid. And also the overall cost if we were paying everybody would be an extra four million, which is not in budget. And Minister, I appreciate you answering that question. I would like more detail in terms of the advice around CA, but I want to touch on the examiners because it's a very topical issue at the minute and it's been raised with us. Yeah. Have you, the advice you received in the direction of travel that you've taken in relation to paying examiners, is it different than that in Scotland, Wales and England? Well, I'm not sure, I'm not sure the detail there, but we have got direct legal advice from the Department of Solicitor's Office um, in connection with that. The position, and it may well be that the precise setup in terms of those contained within other jurisdictions may be in a different position. But here, examiners, and indeed beyond that, people who would be invigilators, people who work below examiners, are on the basis of contract for services. They are not employees. And so the direct legal ad advice was firstly that there's no entitlement to pay beyond the work that's already been done. And roughly speaking, examiners have received roughly about a million pounds because of all the preparation work that had been done paid directly for that. But first of all, legally there was no entitlement and indeed there would potentially be if you were paying people simply on the basis of a hope that they would get some work at some stage um, without being in an analogous position uh, elsewhere that would potentially have legal repercussive uh, qualities. 
uh, across the public sector on a range of things, but also that the proposal that was put forward that only examiners out of that group of roundabout, I think off the top of my head there was about, maybe about uh, four or 5,000 people fell, fell into different categories, maybe wrong in that, that figure, that if you paid one group, legally it would be indefensible to do that without paying everybody the full amount. And essentially, you know, this is additional money which, which people would get who simply are providing a service rather than their job or a full-time employment uh, side of it. So I follow clearly the legal advice. Need to move us on. Robbie, Robbie, Robbie Butler might ask something Thank about you. this or comment on that as well, because I know he feels strongly about it. Very, very, very briefly, when will your independent review of grades grading from last year be started and finished? Well, we would envisage uh, it should be started relatively soon as part of that because it has to be independent. It, it is being um, we saw to think tenders from uh, outside organisations to do that. I understand that's at a fairly uh, advanced stage, but there's obviously commercial sensitivity okay. around when, that. When, I think when, the, when the, the envisage, but chair, chair, Sorry, Chair, just, just to give you the sake of completeness, I think we would envisage that the work, once it is commenced, which should be commenced relatively soon, could then be done within about a period of about six weeks from commencement okay. in relation to that. And there's okay. been terms of reference have been signed off in connection okay. with that. Are you scoping a, a school assessed, a teacher assessed a model for 2021, should it be necessary? We've instructed SEA to look at what fallback options, but it's undoubtedly the case, which will be the case uh, I think across all jurisdictions that everybody accepts that the best possible solution is for this to be to be based upon an exam-based uh, situation. We've asked okay. CIA for their examinations to scope out uh, what a range of fallback options could be. Okay. I, I, I would, I, you know, exams are the best. Okay. And, like, and, okay. and why seven weeks into the new term have you yet to publish um, guidance for this year's curriculum and this year's assessment? Because there's been, CEO have produced advice which is then, from a departmental point of view, we have also then sought views of stakeholders. And I know, for instance, even yesterday there was a meeting that took, took place. I would think we'll be in a position to be able to uh, publish the information which relates to how the curriculum interacts with the examinations again, hopefully for the next few days. One of the other elements that we've got to ensure within that is that we ensure that our examinations have a level of comparability and portability. So there's also then a level of discussions that are ongoing, both in terms of the exam timetable and broad direction of travel with other jurisdictions as well. Again, there's a okay. meeting tomorrow morning of the, um, uh, of the Four Nations group of the uh, education ministers. And I hope that that will be the final position which will then enable us to, to move forward. So I anticipate okay. something fairly Straightforward. It's Thank important you. that we support our pupils in their progression on that basis so we don't disadvantage anybody. Thank you. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Chair. Uh Thank you, everybody. Um, I'll start with the Minister, if that's OK, just to keep on topic here. Minister, because there's a couple of things that were brought out by Daniel and the Chair, which I'd like to just tease out a bit further. So um, I'm glad to hear that you've said that perhaps within days you will be able to give us um, further clarification uh, to the sector and around the curriculum and assessment. Um, that's certainly the number one lobby that I'm getting at the moment from both students and stakeholders, teachers and rep bodies. So that will be very welcome. You've also uh, intimated that the, the preferred uh, assessment will be exams. Uh, and on Daniel's point um, about the assessors and moderators, if that's the case, and you're reliant on those moderators and assessors to be there next year to perform that function, and bear in mind that the right decision was made on sub-teachers with regard to receiving a payment of some kind, what's the difference between sub-teachers who had no uh, work guaranteed and, and examiners and moderators? I suppose, directly speaking, the, the analogy of what's happened in other parts of the UK were uh, in terms of sub teachers. I think look, I think sub teachers have been probably a particular case. First of all, it was something that was directly funded, largely speaking, by the executive centrally. For a lot of sub teachers, um, look, I think there, there, there's also, if you look behind uh, the situation, we rely on terms of sub teachers, and indeed many sub teachers, that is effectively a full time job for them. There are people who will be dependent upon uh, their mortgages, they'll be dependent upon. Um, what you know, if, if you pull the rug from under them, there is a, a major bit. From the point of view of examiners or cohorts there, on that basis, roughly speaking, 
the, the fees would be around about £500. But it is also the fact that it is a direct contract for services as opposed to employment, which is a different, a different kettle of fish on it. Uh, and legally, I think the advice that we got was, was different between the, the two. And in terms of departmental solicitor's office, it is clear uh, that, first of all, there is not an entitlement and that if indeed you were paying examiners, there's a range of other groups you would have to pay simply because it would not survive legal challenge uh, within that. And again, it's about again paying for people for the services that they, they provide on that basis. Okay, just uh, in terms of then that there's a potential risk then that, um, that, that, that their services re as required next year may not be uh, able, then may be a need for you to, to sub out for that. Um, with regard to... Again, again, the target people who would be examiners, as I said, generally speaking, these people who would be uh, either retired teachers who are doing this. Um, I mean, clearly, for instance, nobody's going to survive on simply £500 a year for that particular period of time. There are people that, that actually again, through no fault of their own, the preparation work that they did ultimately was not needed, but they've paid, been paid fully for that, around about a million pounds has been paid directly to examiners in terms of actually a period post-April uh, in connection with that. So, look, there is no solution which is entirely watertight in that regard, but from a legal point of view, that was the clear legal advice that I received, that that was the, uh, the best option that was there from a legal point of view. No, no problem. This isn't the question, Minister, so genuinely doesn't require an answer. You used an analogy of £500 per year. There are examples of particularly female um, uh, ex-teachers who perhaps don't have a good pension and who supplement their income through this quite significantly, actually, um, into the four and five figure um, uh, scale. So those people will be disproportionately affected. Um, with regard to the ongoing situation with COVID, Minister, um, have you been in any discussions about a circuit breaker in and around uh, half term uh, and any extension? Uh, to the well, no. I, can I end again? Well, I mean, I don't think there's been any formal discussions. Uh, clearly, I suppose maybe just disagree, which will also be uh, in relation to the executive as a whole has got to take a broader position as regards the levels of restrictions that, that are there. Um, I think it's probably well known that the Department of Health have drawn up um, a range of measures which at some point you know, could be examined or being used. I think from the point of view of a uh, circuit breaker, um, I think if we were to do that, I, my preference certainly would be that schools still remain open within that. Now it's noticeable, for example, if we use, because I think they've probably been clearer in terms of their, uh, in terms of the overall position compared to jurisdictions, if we use the position of the Republic of Ireland, for instance, they have um, different, if you like, levels of response that is there. But it's noticeable that even in the most extreme lockdown situation of um, level five in the Republic of Ireland, this is still on the basis of childcare and um, education schools remaining open. I think part of the problem, I know we've had the discussion about what mitigation measures, what remote learning measures can be. If children miss, further elements of school, I think that will be both damaging to their education. Uh, and also, there is a strong argument that the more children miss, however much we try and put mitigation measures in, play, in place, it will always hit those who are more socially disadvantaged a harder level uh, than others. So, uh, and I think there's been a strong commitment from the executive to try as much as possible to support education. Now, could there be circumstances in which some of those things evolve? You know, we shall have to wait and see, but certainly it's not something that um, I would want to see on the, the radar. No, I appreciate that, Minister, and I wasn't pushing forward. I was just looking for clarity for teachers and some who have asked. No, no I mean, and the, the nature, uh, I suppose, probably the, the nature of Northern Ireland being what it is uh, on a whole range of issues, various rumours will go about, we will see through social media, things which haven't even been discussed, presented as being, being facts. But look, from, from that point of view, We've made, made it very clear in any level of broader discussion on um, restrictions that certainly it would be my position, position of the department um, that as much as possible education itself needs to be protected. And I think to be fair in terms of a broader position from executive members, I think various members out of, out of all parties have said that, that they see the key priority throughout all of this as being uh, protecting education as much as possible. Okay, final one for yourself, um, Minister, if that's okay. It's around flu jabs for teachers. So. Um, obviously, our teachers have been under immense stress. The, the genuine, I mean, we're, we're now, what, uh, seven weeks into uh, the new term. Um, they've worked ex extraordinarily hard, and, and we want to protect them as much as possible. We've talked about mental health and, and the need for helplines and so on. Um, to protect them further, 
as we move into the winter pressures and so on, has there been any discussions at all with PHA about uh, teachers availing of, of, of flu jobs? Well, I, think, I think Department of Health, in terms of, um, in terms of flu job, will, and the PHA will, will do less of prioritisation. I'd certainly be, um, I think, the more people that we can get with, with, uh, with uh, flu jobs, I think it tends to be that, that they will um, tend to prioritise the, the tradition has always been with flu jobs that tend to be prioritised according to both uh, age and clinical, but rather than profession. But if there's any way that we can help facilitate um, sort of jobs, certainly we would be uh, supportive of that. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm just going to shift very briefly to, to the rest of the guys in the room. Um, Arlene, Tina uh, and Mr Hannah, thank you guys for all the help that you've been so far. Um, Arlene, if just one short one for yourself. Um, with regard to diversionary <coughs> strategies that a lot of youth organisations have been uh, operating for a number of years, um, have you any concerns about those at the moment um, and their, uh, how difficult it is to operate those virtually? Um, and is there anything coming back from those bodies to indicate that there's any sort of uh, issues at the moment? First of all, we've been able to um, provide 91 interventions during the summer through the executive office funding and um, diverting young people away from um, antisocial behaviour around bonfire times and that work was very successfully um, completed and it was safely completed. Um, we have had 3,561 youth interventions with young people in conjunction with the PSNI for children and young people who were involved in antisocial behaviour around um, July and August as well. So at this moment in time, we have very good protocols in place. Our health colleagues and our social service colleagues have come on board with that, and we are able to uh, respond to the needs of young people on the streets and in our communities when they are vulnerable. That being said, we are standing up generic youth services, so we have not got on street youth work and detached and outreach work that happens um, normally at this time operating, but we're working towards establishing that um, towards the end of October, subject to any further restrictions. So actually in terms of, we just had a review meeting yesterday actually, um, with the Assistant Chief Constable to look at what the interventions were over the summer and the impact of that. And uh, everyone was, um, very pleased that actually the communication between organisations and uh, at the government level, us working together, was strengthened. The interface with children and young people increased and there was a decrease in the number of young people being arrested and outcomes that can sometimes um, affect our children and young people negatively in the community. So at this moment in time, we're actually very pleased with the situation that we're in and Queen's University through Dr. Colin Walsh is actually writing up this practice to see what we can look at in terms of the data and we're going to get ahead of this so that before Christmas we have plans in place moving towards um, next year again so that we're providing these interventions all year round, not just leaving it to the last minute. Okay, th thank you. And I've been told by the Chair my time's up, so I'm just going to ask this very, very briefly. So just for Tina, um, Tina, is there... And uh, given what we've learned uh, in the childcare sector, if we are to see more restrictions or a lockdown, in terms of the advice and um, uh, guidance that will be given to the sector, is it, uh, is it ready? Um, if that is the case, what's the contingency plan? And then for Dale, if there's any update on free school meals and uniform grants and any uh, outstanding payments and what that looks like at the moment. Thanks, guys. Can I, can I suggest that I think Catherine Kelly may ask about childcare as well, if, uh, if you want to double those up. And Dale, do you want to come in on free school meals? Yeah, um, in, in terms of free school meals, Robbie, we have we know that in across the system there's about um, somewhere between one uh, one thousand and fifteen hundred applications that we have received that don't have the appropriate supporting evidence, um, and we are currently actively our teams my teams are currently actively contacting those parents to make sure that we get that supporting evidence. We have also though written out to schools to advise that look. Where, where there's an absolute humanitarian need that a school meal should be provided. A uniform grants, any, anything in that, um, Dale? Uh, Robbie, all I, can, I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but all I know is that my understanding is our teams are up to date with the payment of uniform grants. 
Okay. How, how many applications were without supporting evidence? One thousand, one and a half thousand. Somewhere between one thousand and fifteen hundred, Chris. Okay. Chair, sorry. Okay. It's okay. Um, okay. Robbie, thank you. Um, I'll bring William Humphrey in, and I, I, I'm fairly certain Catherine Kelly will ask about childcare, and Tina, you can give us a childcare update at that point, hopefully. William Humphrey? Um, okay, thank you. Um, morning, everyone, and thanks very much. Uh, can I, as a governor in two schools, um, also join in in thanking everyone involved in the education uh, state in terms of the work they've been doing uh, in schools in preparing them for kids going back? I particularly want to thank the Minister for all his hard work because I think it's fair to say whatever criticisms, some of them unfairly he receives, particularly at this committee, the Minister is very active and proactive around these issues. Uh, his department officials, DE officials, and in particular I want to thank Arlene Key and her team and in my area, Mark McBride and his colleagues. Um, I declare an interest as a, uh, a member of the Scout Association and I want to draw attention to the a letter that we all received last week from Claire King and the uh, Uniform uh, Youth Work Hub around outdoor events. Um, I have to say that uh, this is something which really exercised me because I had contact from BBO captains, scout leaders, guide leaders and scout and guide commissioners around these issues because they were only able to do things last weekend that they were able to do the weekend before the same events. Um, and I know there was a meeting which took place on Monday the 28th of September, which Arlene, I think you had attended with, with your colleague. And what has been indicated to me is that what more, present, what more guidance were actually presented as rules and had to be adhered to. And I think around the policy of restart for youth, youth services, it almost appears to me, and I've spoken to a lot of youth leaders around this issue over the last week, that that was provided for schools seemed to be lifted and put for youth and uniformed organisations, and that doesn't really fit or work. Uh, Arlene, would you come back to me on that? Okay. Sure. Go ahead. Um, first of all, um, we engaged with uh, young people and with our volunteers and with our youth staff to provide the guidance. In terms of uh, the Minister's opening statement, the guidance that we have is mandatory for our statutory staff and is guidance for the voluntary and community sector. And it's up to them to take that and to consider within their own governance and management arrangements how they apply that um, with concern that we want to make sure that mitigating factors and the safety of children and young people is paramount. Uh, the guidance that the youth service has provided in the Education Authority um, has been based on, yes, the new school day and the school guidance. Um, it, however, has been adopted to the youth setting and covers a number of factors, including how to support staff, which is separate and very different and distinct, understanding that children voluntarily um, participate in youth service is not mandatory, how to prepare your youth facilities, and we actually provided a video walking around the centre to show an example of how you would have all your signage and all your protective factors physically placed, guidance on detached night reach work, on how to use public transport and dedicated youth work, um, youth transport on social distancing. We even gave curriculum materials as a sample only for staff to be able to look how they can support each other and for us to be able to support our children and young people. So in summary, um, the guidance is based on that of the PHA guidance and the Chief Medical Officer. And we are in a very agile situation where, as the Minister says, we are responding to the ongoing needs in particular situations. And we are in a case um, and point at this moment in time where there is increased cases of COVID-19 and greater concerns. And with that regard, we have asked the Chief Medical Officer for distinct advice on um, ex uh, leaving your centre, your youth centre, going on what we call an educational visit going to an outdoor centre, residential centre, and they are paused at this moment in time. So the situation is very agile, and we were responding to the fact that there are increased concerns and risks that we want to mitigate against. I would say this. All of the people I spoke to are very responsible people. Uh, they, they did the necessary proprietary work the week before. They put in place the risk assessments and all of that, and they, they found it incredulous uh, that the situation had changed. Um, now, 
new regulations have been put in place by the Northern Ireland government in relation to London, Derry, and Strabane, but these seem to be being applied right across Northern Ireland. And all I would say is this: these people are volunteers, highly trained in terms by their organisations, but volunteers are having to work alongside the what, what you're saying is guidance they saw as uh, rules that had to be adhered to. They also have to work alongside their churches and the rules and the guidance that their churches are coming out of, uh, from their headquarters there. And I would say, and I know, I want to thank you and the minister for calls you took from me last Friday around this issue. But well, I would say this respectfully, more work needs to be done with those organisations. And I made this point to you last Friday on the phone with Scouts, Guides, BB and GB and so on to ensure that the, the, the communication uh, is there, that there's clarity and certainty for them around these issues. Because let's be clear, indications went out um, earlier in the year that outdoor work was safer. And a lot of this outdoor work, which you're talking about is educational visits, a lot of that outdoor work um, will continue for scouting and getting particular over the, over the autumn and winter. Yet we will have we will have scout groups and guide companies meeting in church halls. So we need to be absolutely clear around that. And the other thing would make this point as well, in relation to the centres that these organisations run, at Crawfordsburn for Scouts, Lorne for Guides, Ganaway for the Boys Brigade, Ballyhornan for um, Scouting Ireland, these, these organisations need clarity around that because those particular centres, which are very well run, very well maintained, are large cost centres for these organisations, cannot operate to their maximum. Obviously, at the moment, they are under huge pressure. And the other thing is, there, I just saw, read a report earlier today, there could be 15,000 jobs lost across the United Kingdom in terms of, and that's a statement put out by Outdoor Works, um, or work, sorry, UK Outdoors. So we need to be absolutely clear and be getting that information through so that these organisations organizations are able to disseminate this out to the thousands of leaders they have who do valuable work, hugely valuable work in our, in our community. And I don't think um, we're at that point yet, and I hope that we will be um, in the near future. And that's purely the point that I wanted to make this morning. As someone who's involved in scouting and who's aware of the work, the commitment that uniformed organizations and youth organizations do uh, all year round, hugely important, not least in the stuff you were talking about there about diversionary issues in an area like my own in North Belfast and, and they need all the support they can get and, and I think that needs to work. Just to um, give a brief summary of the mitigation and the communication that we have in place, last week I met um, with representatives from the four main churches and we are looking to see how the uniform sector here are currently at a, at a disadvantage because a lot of churches are not given them access to their premises how we can work together and we are working on a plan at that level. Um, we have senior officials within uh, the youth service currently looking at um, uniformed organisations who do not have access to their normal third party um, provision and we are looking to see where within the Education Authority estate we can provide for them free of charge starting um, in the next two weeks. Uh, thirdly, the uniformed hub and the um, full-time officials from the uniform sector have a direct access to me personally as their direct contact for any issues they have, including access to Chief Medical Officer for any concerns, and we meet once a week to scenario plan and look at all their issues. Um, that doesn't mean to say we won't get it wrong. Um, what we are doing is being very clear that we are in a very agile position. We are making ourselves very available. We are working hard on advice and guidance, and we're dealing with a very fluid situation. Um, and I am confident that we have the um, appropriate channels and problem solving, a solution focused responses in place to deal with this issue. And we appreciate it that it's very fluid. So I take on board all that you're saying, William, and we are working very hard to understand this. The yes, minister ma has made progress, and we have obviously um, got uh, very great concerns about our outdoor centres and the cost mm -hmm. associated with that and are working with colleagues to address that as well. Yeah, because I, I mean, I just finished with this. I got an email from our local guide commissioner who pointed out to me that five ranger guides were meant to do the Duke of Edinburgh Gold Expedition last weekend, um, and they had complied and had all been arranged in terms of accordance with the COVID regulations. 
and it had to be cancelled because hiking is not allowed. Um, obviously, they were hugely disappointed, but one girl in particular who, who was coming, who's from Northern Ireland, currently studying university in England, had to come back over the weekend and, and then come back. And it had to be cancelled last minute. So she used out considerable expense for an ex- expedition for her Duke of Edinburgh Gold that couldn't take place. Uh, Thanks, Peter. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, look, I think they're very, very valid points as well. Look, I think the only other thing I'd say as well in connection with this, and I think, look, I think it's, it's important because sometimes people, when they think of voluntary organisations, don't realise that at a, at a wider level there are employment issues as well, which is part of whatever response the executive does in a range of things, it's got to bear in mind what impact this has on people's lives and their livelihoods. I suppose the other area where arguably we are slightly vulnerable will be if there is shifting ground at different stages on what can happen either indoors or outdoors, generally in settings. And at the moment, we're probably in a direction of travel where sometimes some of those restrictions in a wider context are getting tightened up. You know, that might mean what is doable in one particular period a week or two later may not be doable, you know, on that, on that side of thing. But we will certainly try to work to, to maximise what, what can be done within USA, notwithstanding I said that we may we may have a wider context taken sort of beyond simply what, what happens yeah, within yeah. the Thanks, yeah, Darlene, and uh, no criticism, but it's just no, all I'm saying we have communication and clarity and certainty around yeah. these issues. Thanks. Okay. Th- thanks, William. Uh, Minister, just before I bring Catherine Kelly in quickly, can I just a quick point of clarification? Are pupils self-isolating um, counted as present in school? No. Definitely not. Oh, I don't, like, I don't, don't believe so. No, I think okay. this is about attendance. The figures that we have and that are attendance directly in school as opposed to being... Okay. Sorry, I think Dale wanted to come in just there. Yeah. Chair, just, just to yeah. confirm, there's there's a special code for, for those children that are self-isolating that are used by schools. So yeah. when, you, when you're saying there's X percent attendance at school, that... Those are, those are, those are physically in, in the building. That does not include self-isolated Yeah, yeah. It doesn't include self-isolated No, the the figures, so when I was quoting figures around about the, I think one week was about 91.3, another week was 94.5, whatever whatever the exact figures, those are actually, those are directly. directly Can I bring in uh, Catherine Kelly, if you have a question for the Minister? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Arlene, Minister, um, Dale and Tina. Um, My first question is in relation to Nurture, Minister, um, and it's in relation to the announcement of funding being allocated um, recently to the 15 schools, um, and that has been very, very welcome, um, and we can never underestimate the importance of Nurture for our children and our young people and the profound effect it has has on them in the future. Um, the criteria your t- department has used is very important. However, I am curious as to if there was a rural needs impact assessment carried out. I noticed that there wasn't one rural school included in the 15 new named schools and wondered was this something that was taken into consideration. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, there are many rural areas with, with high deprivation and need with schools in these areas struggling to provide nurture um, without the much needed additional funding. Um, St Mary's Primary School in Pomeroy is but one of these schools um, and they have been providing nurture for many years and they actually participated in various studies carried out by Queen's and other universities um, because of their dedication to the nurture program. Um, and I also noted that there wasn't a school at all in West Tyrone in my constituency included either. Um, and one particular school in the area, in an area of high deprivation, is Christ the King Primary School in Oma. Um, they too have a dedicated nurture unit essential in supporting children in this area are, and are also in need of funding to continue this vital programme. Um, Minister, I would, I would ask if you would commit to visiting um, a, the rural school like St Mary's in Pomeroy so that they can actually show you the work that they have been doing down through the years and the difference that that is making to the children who attend the schools, the school and in the community and also 
to visit Christ the King in Oma, um, who have also ticked all, ticked all the boxes in relation to the criteria used. Um, and just to say that any of the, the school leaders who I have been speaking to, none of them um, have said um, or have doubted your commitment to nurture, um, but they have said that the current budget needs to be increased um, for schools to be, be able to continue nurture provision in the time ahead um, because we are in unprecedented circumstances. There are a lot of um, pressures um, on our children and young people and never before has nurture been so important. So that's just um, my first question, Chair. So going back, um, I know there's a bit of a, bit of a, bit of a ramble there, Minister, but... No, 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 um, no, no, just, no, no Catherine, like... Um, so we just announced it. I know you maybe want to come maybe Tina will deal with whatever the next question is on, on childcare. Uh, look, can I say uh, in terms of increasing budget, it's like a lot of things. If I, if I had more money, I'd be very keen to spend that. And I think nurture units, which I think have been there um, under different ministers and times whenever we didn't, have proven to be, uh, I think, a considerable success. Part of the um, the additional funding this year is also to try to, to mainstream that um, that nurture provision as much as possible. There were strict criteria that were applied and schools ranked. So I suppose, if you like, um, for a number of schools, and I would be aware, again, without going these, you mentioned that there wasn't any in, in West Tyrone. Uh, I suppose I can say, for instance, in my own constituency, and I think one, I know of one that maybe fell a little bit below the, the number, I think would have been ranked about 17th or whatever. You know, there was none out of my constituency either in, in that regard. I'll be happy, um, I think fairly soon I'm due to be on visit to OMA. I don't know if, if we'll have time in terms of to be able to incorporate those couple of visits, but if not, I'll be more than happy if I get a, an invitation to try to uh, visit those those couple of schools um, within that. Uh, I suppose this might be I'm being slightly pedantic in terms of the uh, rurality. According to the strict definition, which will be something I think that from a common sense point of view, we'll have to change soon. Strictly speaking, um, the vast majority of the schools were actually rural schools because the current legal definition that is there of rural schools is basically any school that's outside um, the old sort of, um, Belf well, basically the old Belfast City Council boundaries and uh, up in the Northwest, anything else in the country, you know, it was in the middle of, uh, if it was in the middle of Craigavon or Lisburn, actually, technically speaking, counts as a rural school, but I appreciate that. But it's on the basis of, of those that met the criteria to get over the line, first of all, to be considered and then sort of ranked according to the objective criteria it needs. But look, um, visiting schools where they've had that, that nurture bit, we wanted to make sure it's expanded. Because the other bit of the announcement was also that those schools which have previously received funding, that that was guaranteed, uh, that has been guaranteed and, and, and locked in within the mainstream bit. Uh, and again, I think the money that we're providing in terms of nurtures where, uh, the, where the budget then will be as we move ahead into the future years. If there's more money um, that can be provided, then it will be. But uh, you know, there's still considerably a gap between what we would, what on a range of issues would like to be spent on and what we've actually got, there will be a level of, of gap. But I was keen even, even if money was tight to ensure that it was a a considerable level of expansion, at least not nursery. But you know, if I'd been able to announce fifty rather than fifteen, uh, I'd have been very happy to, to do so. In that regard. Just just going back, Minister, sorry, just on the fact that um anywhere um that's outside of, of Belfast or um the, the northwest, um it it's something that if if that is um, that something that the department has to abide by, then there's a serious well, issue I think, there. I think, Catherine, from, from that point of view, that has been a historical thing, which is there. We're actually looking at a formula, uh, and I suppose, again, stuff that will be coming to a conclusion very soon, they actually say that, that actually, if you look at, for instance, uh, what has been defined as rural by, say, Department for Communities or DERA, um, and I think I'm not quite sure one state complication is what is counted as a, a rural urban that makes is entirely uniform throughout government in Northern Ireland. We are trying though to um, to bring a sort of a redefinition, uh, probably based on uh, settlement numbers through NISRA, that which would then would then change that. I think it's just where we're putting the boundary point between the two is just to be entirely safe. Because the other flip side of that is 
you could get um, you could get a school which, for instance, is genuinely in the countryside, if we put it that way, that is, say, five miles outside uh, the city of Londonderry, for instance. Uh, and technically speaking, at the moment, that counts as an urban school. So it's it's, it's I think there's a, an anomaly on both sides on it, and it's something that uh, fairly shortly will get changed. I hope I hope so because um, there there needs to be equality of opportunity here um, in relation to, to all children across the north. Um, well, it's and I'm, I'm and that's why yeah, but that's why the criteria, particularly the nurture bit, was on the basis of objective need on that on that yeah. regard. And to some extent, whether somebody's in an urban setting, whether in a rural setting, and probably to be fair, there's there's quite a few of us out there in different towns in Northern Ireland that wouldn't. I mean, I know that particularly in this basis. It's got to be either kind of urban or rural. I suppose there's a lot of us who live in various settlements that wouldn't really consider themselves either an urban setting or a rural setting, but leave that aside for the moment. It's got to be on the basis of objective need, and simply because somebody is living in one particular location rather than another, they've got to be treated fairly with, with one another. Well, I think, I think that's why the, the Rural Needs Act um, is crucial here. Um, to ensure that you know if, if it is used um, and it has been um, applied in this case, um, that children haven't been disadvantaged who live in rural areas, um, because it has been something that has you know departments, different departments down through the years, um, rural people um, have felt that that um, isolation, I suppose. Um, and here it's just today that that we have more rural schools feeling that same isolation um, and a difference is being made. So I would just, if possible, um, some clarity possibly in writing. There's no, there's, there's no um, we'll, we'll get clarity, there's, there's no discrimination against I think the only issue for nurturing it to work will require at least that school to be sustainable, have a certain level of, of numbers, which I suppose, but having said that can also be the case in some urban areas where they don't meet that criteria either. And that will be the same also for certain levels of capital build and a range of other things. But, not necessarily purely through rurality or even uh, urbanisation. Okay. Okay, Catherine. Um, just, just one, one further question, Chair. Um, just in relation to to childcare. Um, Catherine, can, I, the, can I make a can I make a suggestion that we we maybe get uh, Tina to answer this question? By all means, ask yeah, it as well. Happy. We'll get Tina to answer. Happy to. Yeah. Happy to. And then maybe that creates time for for a quick question from Justin and Morris, Minister. Is that Catherine? Do you want to ask the question, and then I'll, I'll try and get yeah. it? Yeah, go ahead. I'll be I'll be as brief as possible. Um, Tina, in relation to childcare, um, I'm really happy to hear this morning um, that work is underway um, and the discussions are happening around financially supporting the childcare sector um, through the, the winter months. Um, we have been hearing in the last number of days of settings, um, some settings being um, at, at their wit's end, more or less, and possibly having to close their doors. And I know that when we met with yourself and the Minister recently, myself and Kjarn, um, you um, took on board to also look at including the settings, which are community settings, um, and I think there are 74 of them across the north. Um, and just you know, to reiterate the need for um, them settings to also be included in any um, plans going forward. Um, it's with COVID cases um, on the rise across the north. We are seeing where um, an good few number of, of settings are, um, you know, it's not sustainable for them to stay open because of families keeping their children at home. Um, so it's just, just to make that point and also in relation to the childcare strategy, um, it's really good to hear that the discussions are ongoing there and that it was, the all party group um, was um, instrumental in that minister. So um, and, and looking forward to the the innovation labs, um, whenever they happen, um, hopefully as early as possible in the, in the new year. Okay. Can I, can I bring in Justin then for a question to the minister? Oh. <laughs> we need to try and get your way, minister. Justin. Uh, thank you, Sure, And sure, I've, I've more than a quick question. I think I should be designated the same amount of time as every other member. I'm not a second class member of this committee. And the, try the, my best, try my best. Go ahead. Just this should be sure and put so that every member gets a chance to raise their views with each member's opinion. It is important. Go ahead. Um, the, the, ministers, the attendance of teachers, non-teaching staff and pupils since restart 
Um, at 92 to 96 percent is extraordinary given that we are in the throes of a global pandemic. The tenants of special schools, um, that's between 85 and 90 percent, that is incredible. I think there's been, there's been an awful lot of doom and gloom, but given the circumstances, that is extraordinarily positive. And it signals the trust parents have in our teachers. Monday past was World Teachers Day. Will you join with the ministry now in heaping praise on our teachers, on our teaching staff, non-teaching staff, on our principals, in, in creating an environment whereby parents are confident about sending their, their kids to school in the midst of this global pandemic? Yes, Justin, I'm very happy to do so. I think there's been a lot of hard work that's been done, and I think it, it is a, a buy-in of confidence in parents, in our teaching and non-teaching staff, and our broader uh, school system that was provided uh, through our schools, just in the, the, the interest of being succinct type of thing. Okay, um, 3,786 childcare facilities in the north, 3,066 have reopened post-COVID, 720 are still closed. That's 20%. Given the 72% 72, 72 of workers with children under 16 um, live in a household where all adults work, are you concerned that there is now an uh, issue around access to childcare? Well, sorry, I should say in terms of the uh, statistics, the figures actually for sort of the day nurseries and the day nurseries with school place, but the, the figures are around about 94, 97%. What actually brings down those figures um, is if you're counting individually separately, in individual child minders, there's a, a a gap of about 20% on those, that, that's where that tends to, to bring down the figure. Probably in terms of, maybe just for the sake of time, if, if, if I'll deal with any of the non-childcare stuff on it, and then maybe um, at the end, maybe Tina can, can deal with some of those questions, because I'll need to go fairly soon in that regard, Justin, but I'm sure Tina will pick up any of the, the childcare issues. Okay, let's okay, move on to CCA, uh, which Robbie uh, touched on earlier. Um, teachers have contacted me who are at their wit's end in terms of what the content they are supposed to be actually teaching. And I'll read out a quick message um, from one teacher in particular. Um, just a question that maybe isn't easy to answer, but as one of many frustrated teachers in the North, we are almost into the second week of October, and we as schools have had no response to the CCEA consultation regarding GCHCs yet. This is a disgrace that leaves the students not knowing what exactly they are doing, and us teachers not knowing exactly what content we should be teaching. If any influence, could you ask the questions of those who can ask them? So, okay, I can the great level teachers as well. Yeah, to really some extent, yeah, to some extent, I dealt with this earlier. We've, we've worked in the last, not just with CCA, but also stakeholders, but also particularly as regards CCACs and A levels. We want to make sure that what's there is compatible with, uh, to make sure that, that our students are not disadvantaged. I hope to bring that process to, to an end uh, with information by the end of this week. Okay, in terms of the PHA guidance on self-isolation of staff, that's created a little bit of an issue for uh, school principals, minister, um, and those, for those staff who have tested negative but are still self-isolating, and the consistency is key for teaching, especially for primary school children. Are you concerned that there are so many teachers potentially having to self-isolate who have already tested negative? but are not able to return to school, and are, are principals being supported in having substitute teachers provided at no extra cost to their schools, and how, how is that dynamic unfolding on the ground? There's funding, uh, yeah, in relation to that, look, we have to, and I don't, I don't want to make it sound obvious that we have uh, any level of contract, we follow in terms of what has, where people have to self-isolate directly on the PHA advice, and sometimes that will mean people who have directly tested negative, but still under the PHA advice will have to do that, because it's also the case that you could actually test negative on one day and still be a situation a few days down the line, um, you know, could actually have developed symptoms at that stage and test positive. It's not absolutely clear cut in that regard. In terms of the, the situation, there's been funding that's been made available uh, via the executive uh, to schools that would particularly cover the issue of substitute teachers. That has been largely speaking administered by the EA. And what EA, I think, have said. Um, is that in terms of the funding bit of it, that will be effectively demand-driven um, where, where possible um, on that on that basis. I know if Dale wants to say just... I think probably just that we we, we, like, we pull together the costs in terms of what that currently is and then collate that across the system, Justin. At this stage, you know, we're, we're asking schools to 
code, any COVID related cost is specific code, including the cost of additional sub cover. So that, that is being collated, collated on a system wide basis. And then we can work with colleagues in DE around the, the funding for that. Okay, thank you, Dale. Thank you, Minister. In terms of a circuit breaker, Minister, have the, has the input of the unions been sought from the department? In terms of specifically, well, in terms of relation to circuit breaker, in terms of relation to that uh, impact on school. A circuit, a circuit breaker overall will be a wider discussion directly for the, the executive in, in relation to that. Look, I, I, I've indicated that I think that uh, it is the case, and as with other jurisdictions, that education should be protected as, as, as much as possible. But directly speaking, whether there will be a circuit breaker, whether or not, will not be a decision to the Department of Education directly. We will have a view on that, but it will be an executive wide uh, decision. And probably may well be a decision which will also be taken in terms of, and I know first and deputy first ministers have been in touch with um, be it prime minister, Taoiseach, other devolved, uh, you know, so those things will also, I think, probably be taken in a wider, I, I think for Northern Ireland to do something on a sort of a solo run basis would probably not be, you know, in either direction be particularly helpful in that, in that regard. So it's a wider issue for the executive. Okay, well, I think the union should be their, their guidance or their input should be sought in terms of how that will impact them and their members. In, in terms of uh, dyslexia, and there was a commitment made that the supports for children with dyslexia would be the same post COVID as pre COVID. That is not the case. I've been contacted by parents who are really concerned that their children are not getting the same level of support. Can you give me some sort of assurance, Minister, that that's going to be addressed? Well, Justin, if, if you want to send us. Um on that basis, and we're happy to explore it up. Uh, if you send us the details, but don't obviously the details about um, impact on dyslexia, the hand on it. But if you want to send us the details, we'll, we'll chase that up for you, for you and the committee. Okay. Um, screen meals, Minister. Hot screen meals are provided to kids only who are on free screen meals. Other children don't have access to that in some schools. What's your perspective from that on that issue? Well, so I, I mean, yeah, just deal. Yeah, they'll come in just in written. I'm happy to say, Justin, I mean, my information is that 90% of all schools are currently providing um, hot, hot meals to all pupils. Yes, there are a small number where it is only to free school main pupils at the moment, and our catering teams are working with each of those schools on an individual basis to try and ensure that hot school meals are provided elsewhere within the school. But some of those are related to particular circumstances in schools, and again, if you have specific details, I'm happy to try and take that forward on behalf. Yourself. Thank you, Dale. And uh, Minister, in relation to outdoor residential centres who are already struggling, have already experienced tough times over recent years, will you commit to providing funding and support for them throughout this pandemic and beyond? Well, Justin, from, from that point of view, we're trying to get things open as, as much as possible. We can look at bits, but there isn't anything additional in, in budget in, in relation to those things, but we'll try and work with the but we're dependent upon public health advice in relation to that on that side of it as well. Okay, listen, Minister, thank you very much for sticking with me. Um, Derek Baker, Derek Baker's stepping away soon. At what stage does Derek move on? Well, I, to be fair, it will not be that far away. I, I'm probably not not ideal to deal with personnel issues, to be honest, on that side of it, Justin. But no, I just was concerned that the, will, the post will be refilled uh, promptly. Obviously, it's, it's critically important in well, the that there is a permanent secretary by your side to... Well, I, I don't disagree with you, Justin. I mean, I suppose there would be HR processes that would need to be gone through. Obviously, that's an internal civil service recruitment. that We wouldn't be wanting to hold a post open for any longer than it, the, than it has to be in that, in that yeah. regard on it. And I think we'll all miss Derek in that, in that regard uh, on it. But um, certainly, certainly, if I could have a permanent secretary who could be take some of the flack from the, the committee on occasions, uh, <laughs> I, I would be I'd be very welcome to have, have um, somebody from well, the we, we, all miss, we all miss Derek from that respect. Derek has been steady, and we wish him well, yeah, and you know, we listen to your side. And uh, thank you, thank you, Chair, sure. thank you, Peter, thank you, Tina. thank you, Arlene, and thank you, uh, Dale. Really appreciate your time. Minister Morris Bradley's our last MLA and your colleague. You'd be glad to take a question from him. That's okay. Uh, I've got yep. time to take that. If there's any supplementary questions, I know there was a few things okay. on child care that we'll we'll follow those up with the officials. If I take, if I take from Morris, then I'll have to go and believe Understand. The, rest of the officials. Thank you, Morris. Okay. Morris, okay. okay. Yeah. I uh, hope you can hear me all right, Minister. Uh, Minister, thank you and your officials for turning up today and, and yourself available for the, and for the answers so far. I suppose. 
being last on the list, most of the headline topics have been, have been covered. <laughs> one of the things I've heard this morning. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. You're, you're, you're breaking up a wee bit, Morris. <laughs> I, I apologize. Uh, I have a very, very poor connection here. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, start again. Thanks to the Minister for his attendance and for his answer so far and all for his team. Uh, I have been contacted this morning by a parent at a school in the Korean area, uh, two teachers have tested positive for COVID-19. And I understand that HAS had uh, input into the operation guidance was issued by the Department of Education. And I would make reference to the joint assurance group around the deployment of mobile testing units. And, and I suppose thinking of recent measures rolled out at Derry State of the Bank, uh, Council, uh, the Minister has already covered his department's engagement with the PHA, but could I ask the Minister, has there been any engagement using MPU at schools to help identify and, and stem the spread of this virus? Well, look, I think we're working with a couple bits of that. Look, we're working on a constant basis um, in relation to that. I think in terms of there's been a limited amount so far from Department of Health in terms of mobile testing units uh, on, that, on that basis, but we're keen to carry on that, that, that level of work. I think that uh, part of it is, generally speaking, trying to ensure that people get tests um, fairly quickly. Now, I think that the, some of the technology for very rapid tests um, hasn't maybe been able to deploy just as quickly as it, as it should do. I think, to be fair, we're probably, in terms of speed of turnaround on a, in Northern Ireland, it's ultimately a, a question for health, but I think we've tended to have a quicker turnaround in terms of testing facilities um, than uh, other jurisdictions. What is critical, though, as well, which I think was one of the messages that we've got out as well through PHA, is that quite often, um, not somebody confined to parents, but in the wider context, people sometimes are contacting the PHA where tests aren't really necessary. So it's, it's about ensuring that those who need to get get the tests on that, on that basis. Okay, thank you. Another big question. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's in relation to uh, school transport, uh, and I know that the economic downturn uh, following the COVID-19 lockdown uh, has been severe, and I've been contacted by a number of parents who have no support getting their child from the countryside setting to their nearest primary school. under payment made annually uh, in January to cover for the year, but one parent in particular is spending £55 per week on taxi fares uh, to ensure her four-year-old child attends school. Has been offered a payment of 185 million. That's inadequate, and I understand uh, that this is a common occurrence across North Ireland that needs more than a standardised transfer from the EA transport section. Well, what's your yeah, thoughts, I'm, I'm, Minister? I'm maybe, I'm maybe, I'm maybe hand over to Dale. It was, that, it was a wee bit sort of broken yeah. up there, Morris. But I mean, I mean Morris, in, in broad terms, um, we're providing transport assistance to about 85,000 children. Um, a small number of those that, um, about 3,000 across the province, we provide financial assistance through our parental payment scheme. Um, the first thing I would say is that it's assistance, it's not necessarily there to cover the, the whole cost of uh, of the transport costs that are, you know, primarily it's parental responsibility. Um, in terms of the scheme, the scheme was set up in such a way that those pupils that live further away do get a higher amount. So if you're quoting the figure of £185, that would indicate to me that the children are living relatively close to the school. But look, the scheme is there. It's not there to provide the full cost of transport. But again, if you, if you want to write to me with the details of the individual parent, we can have a look at that in a little bit more detail. Broadly speaking, though, if we have small numbers of pupils, we will not be able to put in um, a transport um, provision for them. Um, because um, it, it, it's not efficient. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, Chair. Thanks, Morris. <laughs> Minister, thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'll be honest, that there is a, a, a fairly concerning lack of information in relation to some of the key school restart issues there. Hopefully we can return to them with you. Will you be making a ministerial statement in relation to curriculum and assessment 2021? No, I think, I think the intention would be that uh, we'd get the information out. Hopefully, if, if things could be sorted out by the end of this week, we want to get it as rapidly 
Is there a, obviously, one of the things, given there's been some concerns about delays as well, in connection with that, Chair, um, the, we want the, as soon as things are finalised to get that, that out there, obviously with the Assembly, you couldn't do anything until next week, for instance, if, if we were looking to make a statement. But no, I think it's not we'll get the information out. Minister, you could use the ad hoc committee, as far as I'm aware, again, given you did. I think, I think the ad hoc committee, largely speaking, stood down, in my understanding on it. That's no. not. It's not. Um, you, well, look, I understand the we'll get the stuff saying, out. We'll get the stuff out. We'll get the stuff out in, on, uh, on the next, in the next few days. In that regard. Better go here, folks. But, so, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Tina, to wrap us up, would you like to provide a bit more update in relation to childcare issues? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thanks. I'll just cover sort of the, the three main um, things that I've covered. In terms of, there was revised guidance issued out last Friday um, for childminders for settings, and there was also a parents' letter from the Chief Medical Officer. Um, just in taking on Robbie's point, we do work closely with the child care reference group um, to hear the operational issues as they happen. We meet on a weekly basis. So any guidance or any additional information that is required, we will update with um, our Department of Health colleagues who will liaise with the PHA and get that information out as quickly as possible. In terms of Catherine's few points, yes, we are looking at, we have no funding made available as the Minister had highlighted in his opening remarks, um, but we are working closely um, behind the scenes with the reference group and we're looking at really two subsets. One is to look at the funding and the requirements for like, the temporary closures. We know that there are a few who are having to close on, on taking public health advice in terms of um, COVID issues and what are their needs and what, what can be done and what do they need to look at that. The second part is looking at further sustainability and recovery funding. Um, we know that settings are working with some reduced capacity, um, but it, they still need to work in line with the infection control measures and trying to adhere to the integrity of the pod system. So we are getting some proposals from sector representatives they have done some surveys with the providers and we're also, as part of the jigsaw, looking at parental surveys, um, to, um, which will assist us in seeing what the needs are and what, what support is required going forward. Um, in terms of the child care strategy, yes, we've had an, an initial meeting already on trying to develop and move forward with the innovation lab um, with our colleagues. There's lots of preparations to be done in advance. Um, but we hope to develop a timeline, sort of a roadmap of when they, things can happen in November um, or by November. Um, we are keen to start looking at this again, but it is dependent on how much we're drawn into still dealing with the COVID emergencies and the response, obviously. Um, in Justin's terms, in terms of the closures, um, figures are going up on a weekly basis. At the minute, we are sitting with about 82%, as Minister had highlighted, um, the day nurseries are about 93% day nurseries with school age childcare at 97%. There is some less with creches that haven't opened fully yet. Um, and what we would say is that childminders, there's about 4% of childminders who um, are not, their registration is suspended at the minute as well, but it's for other reasons, maternity leaves, etc. So the figures are rising. We have seen, we're monitoring this on a weekly basis. And in the last two or three weeks, it has risen from Sort of the high 70 percent we're now up to 82 percent okay Thank, thanks very much indeed tina um we, we welcome the work that's being made catherine alluded to the all-party group on child care that you've been engaging proactively with as well and we, we appreciate that catherine robbie do you want to ask any supplementaries in relation to child care or even youth services, maybe Robbie? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah. th thanks, Tina, for that. Just, that just clarifies from earlier on, and I appreciate you coming back to some of those points. And just one um, then for, for Arlene. Um, Arlene, um, with, uh, again, I know William had to do this to you to declare an interest, and I'd have to declare an interest as a boys' brigade officer. So we've been lobbied heavily about the, the guidance and the regulations and so on. But I was just, and just sorry the Minister's not <coughs> here. There is a helpline available for teachers. Um, would, it be, would it be something that maybe you could ask the minister? Could you could you guys benefit from that? That so for the, the sector leads might be able. I know you've got a, a small office which actually functions very highly, 
and you are flat out. So I'm not trying to add to your workload. I'm just wondering, would it be good maybe for you to contact the minister and ask him could could those guys maybe utilise that service, which is open to teachers at the moment, for that Perfect. quick access advice? We sought um, our sectoral colleagues' view on that, and at this moment in time, they uh, don't think that that is something that they require. What they have asked for is a named officer that they can phone on a, on a needs basis for direction. So we have that in place. Um, every organisation has a named person. In addition to that, we are having weekly meetings ranging from about an hour to two hours in the evening with various sectoral groups to problem solve and to build scenarios around and for us to feed questions. So when we get to the stage, and if we get to the stage now that we're establishing services on a more regular basis this week on, the arrangement is, Robbie, that if we need that helpline, there will be a dedicated youth service helpline available at the on the evenings and the weekends for colleagues, but the, the sector doesn't feel it's um, required just at this moment in time. Excellent, Arlene. I'm not surprised that you had an answer for me. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thanks, Arlene. <laughs> Catherine, any supplementaries? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for that, Tina. Um, um, just in relation to, again, the, the community settings, the, the settings who um, are a lifeline, I suppose, to the communities that they're, they're in, um, especially for women um, to return to work and, and also to education. Um, they have not received any support as of yet. I'm just wondering that um, previous to the meeting that Karen and I had with you, if there has been any further developments to that and also to our request for there to be like a, a representative for that, that section of the sector to sit on the reference group. Yes, Catherine, we, we envisage that the community creches will be considered as part of any funding and any scheme that we look at from September onwards. Um, we're looking at across all the providers and yes, we are aware of the community creches who haven't or are not in receipt of any other government funding and the pressures that they will be under. So we will, it is envisaged we will include them in our, our thinking and our considerations going forward. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, we, will, we will do that. And in terms of the reference group, we do have a representative from NICMA that sit on the group. But yes, I have, the group is co-chaired by myself and Department of Health colleagues. So I have raised the issue with them and we will consider, yes, you're following our meeting that we had with you and the minister. Thank, thanks a million. Thanks a million for that, Tina. I think it'll be a big relief to those um, 74 settings who um, have fallen between the cracks up until now. Yeah, I would just add that we, we need to look into that because some of those will already receive other forms of government funding. And of course, as you would expect us to, we, we just need to be careful about double funding and what other forms, but they will form part of our considerations, um, the 74, and we will look in depth at those is, is what I'm saying. So we just need to be careful about other government funding as well that's going to some of those crashes. Okay. No problem. Thank you, Tina. Thanks, Thanks Chair. Thanks very much indeed, officials. Uh, grateful for your time this morning and obviously indeed for the, the ministers. Uh, um, continue good wishes with the extremely important work that you're all taking forward on behalf of children and young people across Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Okay, Clark, can I ask you to summarise any actions or requests for additional information resulting from the briefing? Uh, can I just ask Assembly Broadcasting just to remove the witnesses and add all the members to the spotlight so they can uh, feed back if they hear something they don't like? So um, I think perhaps, Chairperson, the committee wants to write to the department seeking information on um, teachers who have tested positive or are self-isolating, including particularly P7 teachers. Also uh, looking for information about pupils who are have tested positive or self-isolating. And we'll just, we'll just get them to come back in writing about how they are recorded on this uh, other code. Uh, perhaps also the committee is wishing to seek uh, clarity on a timeline and advice uh, that will be provided to schools who have elected to not use post-primary transfer um, testing uh, in, the, in the coming year. Uh, additionally then, um, and with respect to the widening of access to IT support, um, to ask the department to set out the number of laptops that have been provided and to which schools they have actually gone. Yep. Um, and then in respect of Engage, 
Um, I think is the committee you know, expressing concerns around the, the banding and how this is going to lead to some variation in their per pupil um, funding? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if time allows or not, um, Clark, but um, would be possible to get a very short oral briefing on the, on the model that was used to allocate engage funding? Uh, um, it, it's not page 100 of your packs. It is pretty simple what they've they done. Okay. Fair sorry, enough. sorry. That's, that's not what I meant, but Fair it's enough. just, I, I don't know what Fair they're going to tell us. I'm going to pick out the most, the, most, the easiest one to spot, which is when you go from 80, is it 200 to 1,000? So the band yep. is 200 to 1,000, so it's a Correct. difference of 800 pupils. Of, yep. And the, the, the disparity is up 100 pounds per head, possibly. On, on schools with free school meal entitlement below 28%, there's yep. also a band of greater than. 500 mm -hmm. so that's going to include schools from 500 up to 2000 yeah. approximately um okay info's there members can review that and ask further question at future dates if necessary Thanks, Clark. also just to advise members I'd, I'd sent you a little email uh, a day or two ago uh, to the education authority's website and that shows the allocations that have been made to schools for other things like PPE and cleaning not the same as engage but just schools have received other monies uh, and then in addition then um, following up on Catherine's question to write to the department about nurture asking them to set out the criteria for support for those schools that have received um, the support or not and also to clarify around uh, rurality because uh, that is something that was asked, um, the committee has uh, asked about previously. And that, members, is all I had. If there's something I've missed or something that is wrong. Any other actions or requests, members? Yes. Chair, can I come up here? Okay, yeah, we'll go Karen and then Justin. Just on, on the, uh, the devices, yeah. uh, just if we could, he, he did say he was going to look at widening out the scope in terms of the criteria, if we could get clarity on that, please, Chair. Okay. Uh, Justin and then Robbie. Yes, uh, can we write to Derek Baker and thank him for his uh, efforts during his time as uh, Permanent Secretary for the Department of Education and wish him well in the next phase? Great. Um, yeah, I suppose point of clarification, he, he is scheduled to uh, depart but has not yet um, retired. What? Is this public information? Yeah, uh, I'll have a is chat. <laughs> I'll talk to the Dallow and okay. uh, she's we'll, going to say we'll, congratulate we'll, someone in the retirement. We'll, we'll double there. check the best way to um, extend that sentiment. Justin, I uh, appreciate that. Okay, is he agreed? Okay. Is that a great chair? Agreed, members? Yes. Yeah, and then I'll bring Robbie in as well. Yeah, Robbie? Right. Yep, just on Karen's point about the, the computers, it's a good one. Um, the scope of it, just to include, if you don't mind, you can ask, um, have teachers, any teachers, uh, have they been able to avail of it, or could they avail of it? Avail of Teachers, in terms of, uh, so in terms of this learning and providing the learning online, if they have to isolate, have they access to the appropriate IT to, to work from home? So the, okay. there is, the devices are for pupils. for pupils at the moment. The question yeah. is yes, what, what type support. of devices support is provided to teachers. teachers? Yes, okay. Yep. self isolate lovely stuff. Thanks, members. Thank you. Okay. Any other actions or requests, members? No. Okay. Are members agreed on those actions and requests? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Just the AOB. Okay. Members, AOB, um, if, I, if I could just briefly ask you just to hear me out on, on the post-primary transfer survey briefly. Um, I, I reiterate my apologies for being um, absent this morning due to an unavoidable medical appointment. Um, and the understanding is that the, the committee um, is adopting an approach of, of publishing the survey without uh, an assembly debate on the survey. Um, can I just check in what way and format and when we would be publishing the survey, Clark? Um, well, I had thought to put it onto our website. I would uh, talk to our communications colleagues so they could um, you know, publish it appropriately. We've had a few people contacting us already who uh, completed the survey and want to know what the results were. So okay. go up on our website, publish it on social media. Okay. Um, members, can I, can I just... Can I the clarity, uh, Chair. Yeah, yeah. It's not that we said we, we didn't want the motion. What we said was we would publish it and probably support a motion when we get some feedback from it. So there wasn't it wasn't okay. that we didn't want to have a motion. So what we said was we would publish it, talk about it again, and probably. I mean, I would be supportive of a motion at the right time. And I think. Okay, it's okay. Clarity. My, well, just my that that's helpful, Robbie, because my my point and my concern would just be that um, a, a, a significant 
amount of work has gone into the survey. I think there is, um, it's not a perfect survey. People will have their criticisms, not least due to the speed with which we had to employ it, given that it is focused on this year. Um, but there's a significant amount of work that has gone into that, that, that survey that gives rich information, feedback and data. Um, and I, I would be concerned that if we don't coordinate an assembly debate alongside shortly after or at the same time as publication of the survey, that you would miss out on an opportunity to have a really open, hopefully informed, balanced debate on the findings in the assembly where the work was done, rather than via just only the media, um, which is a, an, an important place to have a public debate, but it is a different format to what I would imagine it would be a debate in the assembly. Is there, Clark, is there any scope for me to propose that that we that we do um, seek uh, you know a drafting of a motion at the very least or time slots for a motion um, even if it's not possible to agree a motion date at this stage? I think, Chair, the committee has agreed its position and we've moved on. However, if you wish to prevail upon the member of the business committee, if you knew them to keep a wee slot for us uh, in the in the, the coming weeks, because I know in the next couple of weeks there's a lot of budget things, which will take a lot of time, and that would push a, a committee motion way down the list. So um, maybe yeah. if... Uh, I see Karen wants to come in as well. Chair, Clark, yeah, Karen, yeah, yeah. Karen, yeah. Chair, Chair sorry, you're breaking up um, really badly there, couldn't get it all, so apologies. But same as Robbie, I, I think there was just a wee bit of... I felt about mis miscommunication when you came back into the room. What I had agreed to was publishing of the survey followed by the motion, and I believe it needs to be a very strong motion coming from the committee on it. So sort of get the survey out in, in the public domain for a couple of weeks, but we can have the motion ready and ready to go. Okay, okay. so is it, uh, that's, again, helpful clarification. So um, can we, or, okay, Clark, so you have an agreement. Just, keeping just, this, um, uh, Clark, just keep this stick to, stick to the process here. Um, William, do you want to come in briefly before we go back to the clerk here? Yeah. The person who proposed it, how did the clerk record it? Uh, yeah, Chairperson, uh, to clarify, um, what the committee agreed was to publish the information, which was grand, and then to defer consideration um, about uh, a motion. So okay. I, I, I suggested a motion. It was actually in the um, in your meeting packs, but you're deferring consideration. So that just means can we if defer you like, consideration to next week? Yes. You okay. Can, did, is that, didn't uh, specify. Is that a fair way forward at this stage, uh, members, for us to defer consideration of the motion until next week? Yep. Members agree? Yep. Okay, that's great. Um, and so when, when exactly will it be published then, Clark? Next, next few days? Or, yeah, yeah, next yeah? few days. Yeah, okay. we're, uh, Louise knew that, so we were ready to go. Okay. And will we issue any press release or just via social media as per the survey itself? Well, I think media. it's uh, up to members. Um, we were just going to go... I, I tend to find press releases end up in the circular file, would it be could, my experience. Could, I, I suspect it could be challenging to agree a form mm. of words in press release as well. So <laughs> <I do. laughs> we'll go with social media and we'll work on the assembly debate. I, I, I genuinely believe that the, the extent and significance of the work that went into the survey and the extent and significance of the information gathered by the survey seriously merits an assembly debate of the findings of the survey and, and I would wish that to be as, as soon as possible to avoid this being um, just debated via ju just media which is obviously a, a fully appropriate format to do so but uh, you know that the work was done in the assembly it'd be good to have it debated there as well okay members any other business yes who's that go ahead I think he's on the phone oh another phone Okay. No other, any other business members? No? No? Okay. Thank you, members. The mm. date time of the next meeting is Wednesday, 14th of October in room 29, Parliament Buildings in Vast Starleaf at 9.30 a.m. Uh, the committee meeting does now adjourn. Push the button there. Thank you. you. Thank you so much. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room, 
29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.